the Allah. people of the book before you were destroyed due to the fact that they turned to the books of their scholars and abandoned the book of their Lord. Writing of a hadith and writing an official book of hadith. Those are two separate things. So what they would do is they want to check his adala, his reliability and his memory, uh, his honesty. So you don't even see them attributing the word lie to Muhammad. They are calling them liars, mm. but they know how bad it would look if we constantly said they were lying. My attribution to the Prophet ﷺ through Abu Nu'aim, I can say, okay, Alhamdulillah, is correct. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan lil-alameen, Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man ihtada bihadihi wa stanna bi sunnatihi ila yawmidin amma ba'd. Welcome everyone to another Project Ihya podcast. Alhamdulillah. Uh, today we have a important and very special guest with us. Uh, we have with us Mufti Muad Chatti from uh, the UK, and uh, I'd like to start off by first welcome him, welcoming him uh, to the program. Mufti, Sir, welcome to Project Jazakum Allah. Jazakum Allah. Happy to be on. Welcome. Mufti Muad uh, was born in Blackburn and completed his Islamic educational studies in his local maktab. In 2006, Mufti Saab went on to complete his Adamiya studies in Jamiatul Ilmi Wal Huda in Blackburn, UK, studying under great luminaries and ulama there, such as Mufti Abdul Samad Ahmed Sahib, Mufti Shabir Ahmed Sahib, Mufti Ikram Al Haq Sahib, and Mufti Inayatullah Sahib. After completing his Adamiya and secular studies in 2015, he traveled to South Africa, Durban, to study the Khassus Fil Fiqh under the tutelage of the late. Great Mufti of South Africa, Mufti Ibrahim Desai Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Upon completing his Ifta studies in 2017, he moved to Benoni, South Africa to study a Takhassus Fil Hadith course as well. He then returned to the UK in 2018. Currently, Mufti Sab teaches Fiqh and Hadith at Jamiatul Ilmi Wal Huda. In 2022, he founded IslamicKnowledge.co.uk UK to provide access to traditional and academic courses on various Islamic fields for the Muslim community. And inshallah, the website will be launching in the next few weeks. So we encourage everyone, inshallah, to um, we'll actually update it on our project Ahiyah community, inshallah, for those of you who want to, inshallah, access and are interested in that um, web page and what Mufti Sahib has to offer. And inshallah, today's podcast is going to surround around the topic of, uh, or uh, revolve around the topic of hadith. Uh, Mufti Mu'ad has recently written, uh, or, com or is on the precipice of completing his book on uh, hadith, which is titled An Introduction to the Science of the Noble Hadith. And inshallah, we're going to engage with uh, Mufti Mu'ad uh, regarding the book and other topics pertaining to uh, the science of hadith. So, inshallah, before we jump into it, I want to ask uh, Hafiz Mus'ab, inshallah, if he wants to say anything, uh, then we'll start. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, I would also like to extend my warm welcome to uh, Mufti Mu'ad. Thank you so much for coming on, and it's a pleasure to have you. Inshallah. So, um, I guess we can start off with the first question, basically, and uh, ask uh, Mufti Sam that what drove you to write uh, the book itself. Uh, there are books that are available regarding the you know, hadith or an introductory uh, sort of approach to hadith. So if Mufti Sahib could just uh, speak to what he felt or the need that was that he felt um, yeah. for writing this book, inshallah. Yeah, I mean, Jazakallah Khaira for the introduction and, you know, Jazakallah for the lovely uh, welcome as well. Now, to just briefly kind of explain what exactly this book is, and I, I noticed you mentioned that the book is on the precipice of being finished. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, it is finished. It's gone for publication. It should be here within the next... It, it's been a real delay, honestly, in getting it here. I don't know if it's to do with the shipment issue or what, but there has been a bit of a delay, so I apologize because loads of people have been asking. Uh, constantly that when is the book going to be released and alhamdulillah I can, I can tell you that it will be next week it will hopefully be with me um, and it should be available to to be purchased on the website yeah, uh, I can't which, imagine a lot of people are going to be waiting for it because there's there's very little material in English yeah I guess, the so this of this is exactly what I want to kind of discuss and you know alhamdulillah I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing this idea so 
it's available inshallah on www.islamicknowledge.co.uk as you mentioned and it'll also be available on ismailbooks.com uh, or .co.uk i don't know which one he has now um so how did this whole idea come about so essentially um you could say the starting period of it could be in bukhari years as I was sitting in, like, you could say Mufti Shabir Sahib's lessons, and Mufti Shabir Sahib is, by the way, just as a brief introduction, he is like a senior scholar in, very senior scholar in the UK. You could say he's taught most of, like, you know, a lot of these young ulama, you could see Mufti Abdurrahman Mangera, um, all of, like, you, you know how you have those Ustadul Asati, the type of figures? He Indeed. is like that in the UK. And we were very lucky for him. He never used to actually teach in our institute, and just the first year that, 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 year that i was in bukhari was his first year of teaching in our institute he moved to our institute um so he was teaching and we've never had this before where in a teacher is quoting books like in from his notes he's just reading books and he's just like uh, you know i'm sure your audience um won't mind me quoting saying a bit of urdu inshallah he, so he's as he's saying he's yeah you know he's he's mentioning all these random names and we're just like well, i'm writing the, all of these notes down and i'm you know he speaks very fast we're writing these notes down and as i'm writing i'm thinking what is this book you know to the extent where i'm you know you could say this is an embarrassment but some would say this is quite embarrassing a student has come to bukhari and he actually doesn't know the names of certain books like um like some some books which everyone would probably know the names of like al-muhalla of ibn hazm um he would say ibn hazm ne likha hai al-muhalla me and i'd be like what is this book al-muhalla like sounds like some type of a weird name and mm. and i had this type of thing where what i would just go go and do is when i'd go home because the library for us was like a bit it was a bit difficult to you know constantly go to a library etc i just go home and google these names and i'd just be like what is this and i'm learning about these books and you know all of these opinions to the extent where I, I mean again this is like probably a sin but Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba I'd come across he'd say that name and I'd be like what is this book mm. I, I know the Kutub Sitta I know probably a few Shuruhat written on all of these major books of Hadith what is Musannaf Abdul Razak and I'd seen the book I'd say what is it about so that's where you could say the first initial idea was already there then when I traveled to South Africa obviously got engaged in Ifta etc the second year in our iftar studies, what we usually do is that, alhamdulillah, we study al-madkhal. Uh, al-madkhal ila ulum al-hadith al-sharif. So I've actually bought some of these books here just so that I can actually show, because I usually do like to show people these books and what they actually yeah. look like. So we studied this book of Mufti Abdul Malik. Now, I don't know if the camera will just reverse it or not, but this is al-madkhal ila ulum al-hadith al-sharif by Mufti Abdul Malik. It's been printed by Darul Rayahin. Um, there was an old print of it. So we studied the old print and we studied it with Mufti Hussein Kadodia. So as we were studying this book, what is this book technically about? Essentially, this book is the number one book that students should be reading if they are graduating from uh, Darul Ulum. But really, I would say this book isn't just for graduate. If you could start reading it literally from your fifth year, fourth year even maybe, you should be reading this book. Um, so he kind of goes through all the different books. of It's actually a book written on takhrij, how to find a book of hadith or how to find a hadith rather. And as he's doing that, He's introducing various books. So I thought this is brilliant. This is absolutely fantastic. And as I was studying it with uh, Mufti Sahib, Mufti Hussain, I realized that this book needs a translation or we need to do something about this book. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mufti Ibrahim Desai, may Allah have mercy on him, he used to have this fantastic idea, which is well, he never used to have exams. You never do exams in Ifta, in our year anyway. I can't speak for all the previous years. What you essentially do is whatever book you're studying, you summarize the book after mm -hmm. you finished it or as you're studying it, you're summarizing it and you kind of do it like a sort of dissertation on the book, so to speak. So I thought I want to do it on this. Like I want to kind of start summarizing this book or kind of making my own notes on it. But me being me, I just, I like to make it like all fancy, different colors and all of that. So I started doing that on the Microsoft Word and it just started from there. And after a little while, I realized this is becoming a book now. Mm. And so it kind of started off as a translation of this book, so to speak, but then it started to develop a lot further. And then it took about good, and this was about 2016, 2017. And since then I would just continuously be adding stuff to it. As I would read new material, I'd be adding constantly. So it is, you could say a work that has, you know, taken over about five years at least, along with working on other projects as well. Interestingly, and I just mentioned this to my wife the other day, I was just saying, well, um, before I got married, uh, there was a certain amount of work I had done on the book. 
then after I got married, a certain amount of work was, and I was then after I had a daughter, I had a child. I was actually thinking it's finished now. Like my life is over. I'm not going to be able to work on this book. But Subhanallah, they say that daughters bring barakah into your life, and I actually managed to do more work on this book after uh, you know having a daughter. Alhamdulillah, you know. Uh, uh, so she was always very upset at that that you know it took the daughter to kind of. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, I got a lot more done in the last few years. And then there are a lot of works, like you said, on this topic in Arabic. There are loads. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, and we look at some of these just now, inshallah. There's a Sunnah qabla tadween. There is also, um, you know, a Sunnah wa makanatuha fi tashriir al Islami by Mustafa Sabawi. A Sunnah qabla tadween is by Sheikh Muhammad Ujaj al Khatib, a very, very common book and, you know, very common I use. I have it right here with me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, a it. student of hadith will always have that book somewhere close by and it's it's a fantastic book so i use that book as well i added to mufti abdul malik's al madkhal so al madkhal became like a blueprint at the start but mm -hmm. by the way when you see this book it's not going to look anything like al madkhal um it's yeah we're gonna have it, so it's not necessarily a translation of mufti abdul no Malik. not at all it morphed into something completely different like for example uh, just to give you a brief example like there are biographies of authors in this book and there are absolutely very little biographies in al madkhal of mufti abdul malik uh -huh. so it became something there are pictures in uh in this hadith book that are not found in al madkhal there are new books that i've introduced that are not in al madkhal I've, I've, I've spoken about maktabat al some of the other hadith uh, programs that you can use to find a hadith etc as well now in terms of english books now th there are others as well. There's um, there are other Arabic books as well. I don't want to make it look like it's very limited. But in terms of English, we've got Mustafa Al Azmi's very famous studies in early Hadith literature. So I've just brought that with me uh, here. Studies in early Hadith literature, and we've got this book by um, I think he's a doc Dr. Garrett Davidson, uh, carrying on the tradition. Now I don't actually have a hard copy of this book, like a original copy yeah. so i don't want to get in trouble for you know for copyright but what i did was we have this company in the uk called doczu and i've spoken about them on twitter and some of my youtube videos as well um so if the book is really expensive um i may be guilty and i might have done it a few times when the book is not expensive as well but if the book is really expensive and if you go on amazon for carrying on the tradition which is this book here mm -hmm. uh, it's about 50 to 60 pounds which is you know it's unreasonable i think that's too much so what i do is i just send the pdf to this company and they just print it for me so i i, I use this book as well to some degree but as much as possible because the book is geared for darul ulum students and that's the main point that i want to come to this mm -hmm. book is unique in the sense that every english book that i read that i read or have been told about i pick them up like even pick up this one right it's not geared for darul ulum student and the clear evidence of that is that you pick it up and you'll find audience uh, you'll find certificate of the audi audition notice for example and that's basically talking about the tabaqatu sama uh -huh. what uh, if a student reads that a darulum student he will just be like what is this what are these words and I, and just to show you like a practical demonstration of this in my ifta class we read a little bit of because so, in the ifta class we go through more history of fiqh and that's another book that i'm working on an introduction to the hanafi madhab so we we were going through um, a book I think by Melchett just to kind of critique the book and we went into like one week of reading and one of the students said to me I'm finding it too hard can we just change the book and can we just go back to it like I can't I don't understand any word that he's saying the words are just too difficult so that's when I realized this book needs to be super simple and that's why you know if you're watching this and you're like basically a, a Darulum student and you're thinking this book is not going to be for me because the English is going to be too hard it's not going to be like that the english is super easy and i've tried to make sure that any place where in it needs to be a bit hard i've tried to make it as easy as possible mm -hmm. um and another thing that i wanted to do in this book was obviously um and uh, one more point that i want to make is that uh i'm not for english books so much in in the syllabus like in the sense that at the start i'm okay with like if you have uh, for a nahwa kitab you can't just jump straight into nahwa without having some basic english book in the arabic awal stage yeah, uh, but after that, I'm a big proponent of the fact that get them onto like Al Ajrumiya and then get them into like the Sharah, or the different Shuruhat, then get them into Mutamima, then you know, whatever, jump into Ibn Hisham at some point and take it up from there. And don't have too many contemporary books. And now that sounds like a hypocrite because then I've written a book that I would, you know, ideally prefer. Okay, I'd really, you know, beg or hope that institutes put it into their syllabus if Allah wills and you know, if that's written, it's written, if it's not, it's not. 
The reason why I would say this book doesn't break my principle is that this book introduces other books. So it guides you. It's got an introduction to, for example, Fatful Bari in there. It's got an introduction to Ma'alimu um, Sunan of Al Khattabi. It's got, so it will teach you how to use books. It teaches you how to use Tuhfatul Ashraf. It teaches you how to use Ithaf al Mahara. Uh, it gives you diagrams. It gives you sample pages. I've put QR codes in there that you can scan and they will take you to the PDF of the book. Um, it's got loads of other stuff. The, all the death dates of all the scholars are in there. So you can kind of like keep a note of all the death dates. Another thing is you've got biographies of over 25 uh, muhaddithun. So you get to appreciate the efforts of the muhaddithun and who they were. You get to kind of relate to sure. them. That's all in the footnotes. And along with the actual book as well, by the way, you do get access to like an online course. There is a slight extra fee for that. But you get access when you actually teach the full book as well. So a student could have actually like a, a teacher's course with it. Yeah. And which is over like 30 hours and you can access that course using the book itself so the book is a very like interactive type of book type of book um alhamdulillah when i showed this to certain scholars as well they did say exactly what uh, uh, what, you, what you just mentioned them which is that in english we've not seen a book like this yeah. which is so simplified so easy to use and at the same time i do think academics will benefit from it as well i've tried to limit the amount of uh you could say orientalist or the academic uh, quotations, but I have used them, but I, I limit them because I don't want the students, I want the students to be sticking to as much as possible the traditional ulama and kind of reading those books, but at the same time, using those books to kind of already, um, not refute, but kind of lay the foundation for the refutation of some of the ideas that come from non-Muslims on hadith criticism as well. Mashallah. And also, I think another thing that would stand out with this book is that it's formally teaching how to do takhrij and things yes. like that, which yes. aren't normally necessarily taught formally in the madaris. You just kind of yes. have to figure it out or you have to go to, you know, a special... 100%. Yeah, 100%. and I, I, that that makes me probably want to add that I don't I don't think this book is trying to in case anyone gets scared that oh this book is going to try to tell you you can do it your, on your own and you can do it on yourself. It, this book quite clearly in the introduction tells you I'd prefer you to study it with a teacher. Um, yeah. Only if you don't have a teacher, then you study it on your own and even that access the recording so you can at least hear me kind of going through the book. Um, so inshallah, I do think, and I pray and make dua that inshallah, Allah that I put Yeah, and another thing, you made it interactive. So I think that also kind of emphasizes the point that um, you shouldn't try to just jump into it on your own. Yeah. Uh, engage 100%. with the other tools that have been added to it. I think that's an amazing idea. Um, there was one other question that I had. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, about the the terminology or the jargon that's usually used. And you say that the, the book itself kind of sets itself apart from the other ones that you uh, showed. Um, do you think it's important at some point for students of Hadith to actually come to some sort of understanding of um, the academic jargon or the way that it's... Um, 100%. So I've spoken about this with like a few, a few scholars and a few, you could say, friends as well. What can we do to bridge this gap where... What we don't want is students to just go off and read all of these books on their own without any guidance. Um, I think that can lead to problems because you, what you, someone might say that's that's not right. You're not letting them be critical, etc. But there is a risk to that. They could end up having so many doubts over, over certain issues that it could end up being problematic. But they will learn the jargon along the way. Yeah. The risk is, like I said, the risk far outweighs the benefit, which is that they could end up having for problematic views. They know what they're reading now, but they, yeah. they're reading problematic stuff. But we also can't forget the other side. We can't also have a situation where the students feel completely safe in their bubble, mm -hmm. but they don't know any of the jargon out there. And therefore, when they interact with that jargon, they just close off. And therefore, there's a really strong argument there kind of refuting or supposedly refuting our idea of what we think happened in the Hadith process. Mm -hmm. But they can't read it because they can't. So one of the ideas that I've actually thought of, and I think someone should do this, I don't think I have the time, is a dictionary. Um, just a dictionary of just, or, you know, like a... Like a yeah, I mean, we live in a quirky world. People are coming up with some crazy ideas of what kind of books to come up with. We could have a book which is just for Alim class students, yeah. and it's just got all the jargon in there of um, <laughs> really hard language. And yeah. you know, it, that that could be something fantastic. Like for example, just taking the concept of like just what we just said there, audition notice, and just putting that under A, under the subcategory of U, and then yeah. just putting uh, 
i.e. that certification which is and that, that would just really really help students even it happens in fiqh as well uh, we've got the living tradition so for example you know you go on the L and you just find living tradition and okay what is living tradition I keep seeing another yeah. one I mean some of the simple ones uh, and most of this is something that I myself struggle with you might think this is so basic and you didn't know the but this is the situation that we are in as Darum students it's like we had stuff like epistemology, just that simple word, which probably a university students m may pick up very quickly. Yeah. Um, they won't pick up some of the more detailed, you know, stuff that our students pick up. But just because of the fact that our students don't know the word epistemology, they now, you know, they come across the word epistemology and they just get put off from this book. I don't even know what he's saying. The whole the whole discussion seems to be around epistemology. I don't know what that means. And in reality, um, it's funny because they might know actually, they might understand. Yeah, they, that's what I'm saying. The They'll probably know the topic better than that university. Uh, and they start having this sort of like uh, inferiority yeah. complex almost. But I agree with you that I think that the, the, the jargon or the terminologies itself is something that can be sort of post- um actually having a grounding in our own tradition uh because like what you mentioned is actually pertinent it's important a lot of students they go off to universities and they do read the english side of things without having the grounding 100%. and then we see the, the amount of uh, the, the habit that it's breaking yeah 100 percent. i mean if you only read the english stuff you could honestly be really really confused whereas if you only read the arabic stuff you'll also not know how to engage with the english stuff so yeah. it's that balance where another word just that just came to my mind like something i came across like normative practice so when yeah. i read normative i was like what is normative practice yeah. what does that even and it just took so many times just reading that word and seeing the context and i, I only worked out the definition of that word yeah. simply by looking at the context of where it's being read and where it's being said so it's it's a it's a tough one but I, I do think students should be taught and then they should be encouraged to kind of read these books under the guidance of a teacher mm -hmm. and that means that the teacher needs to be reading these books um with obviously a traditional mindset but making sure that you're reading them critically and i believe in critical uh idea like in the sense that just like um just like we read our stuff like and we'll come across this if we have time the critical approach of the muhaddithun that being this idea of this idea of being able to question your teacher um like for example i've presented in the book number of scenarios where in tabi'un are questioning the sahabi but not in a kind of like we have doubt over what you're saying but they just want to really make sure they like such like they have such determination to acquire the truth and exactly the truth that yeah. they will actually say uh, uh, like you know they they want him to actually take an oath not because they don't trust him but because that they, they just want to re be really sure like for example the sahabi is about to uh, go to war against the khawarij and he's narrating a hadith that is against the khawarij so now the tabi'i even though he trusts the sahabi 100 but he still wants to make sure yeah. um and sometimes they'll ask where did you hear this who, who can you can you describe him for me who was your teacher and so th this type of critical nature um, our students do need to have it and they do need to read these books written by these orientalists but just with the guidance of teachers and basically an understanding of what these difficult words are i think yeah no that's uh that's an incredibly important point because i think that's also sometimes kind of lost in um in, in madaris is that um questions are kind of like held within yourself you don't actually speak up and i yeah. think that's a, an important part of a so we were just discussing this yesterday with a couple of ulama that this is where I would say the Hanafi approach is very different. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and as someone who reads Abu Hanifa's biography a lot, like I'm, I'm slightly obsessed with Abu Hanifa, you could say. Um, one, one thing, I, the reason why I like him so much in the sense that I read so much about his life is that he had this tendency within his nature to allow the students to just say whatever they want, mm -hmm. speak your mind. They'd rather ad address and say their issues in class and whatever doubts and whatever issues they're having and then we can address them and if we don't know how to address them we can learn ourselves of how to addressing them yeah. um so we have loads of stories of sufyan ibn Uyin actually you know s s scholars of the ahlul hadith coming to imam Abu Hanifa and saying why are you letting these students just raise their voices in the masjid and then he says no no this is how they will learn and this is, I want them to do this. I want them to kind of respond to me and come back to me and, you know, tell me I'm wrong. I love it. And so I, I try to develop that within myself as well. That I, I actually tell my students, I don't want you to agree with me. I want you to disagree. 
And that's how I will learn and that's how you will learn as well. But as long as we're doing it within the paradigm of like traditional thinking respect. and you know and respect, hundred percent. With respect to you, you must. And Subhanallah, going back to your point on technical jar, uh, jargon, uh, if you see um, if you see our uh, ulama, uh, for example, if they've studied in uh, Urdu, they are actually masters at Urdu, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a new problem in English because um, this tradition uh, is new in America, in the West. Um, so uh, we kind of have to lay the foundation for that going forward. Uh, but the ulama should be like the best at whatever language uh, they're in. Hundred percent. And sometimes, uh, when you actually read what they're saying, it's actually really simple. They're saying something really simple, yeah, yeah. and you've you've known about it since you were in the third year of your alim course, yeah. or maybe even second year of your alim course. But the way they've worded it creates such a type of inferiority complex. That what is this? I've never come across this before. And when they, someone tells you and explains to you, all he's saying is when something is qat'i, you know, it's like this basically. You're like, oh, I knew this since, like, I know this since, you know, I was yeah. in my third year. So it's just about getting past that barrier um, <laughs> and, you know, engaging in that and learning how to yeah. deal with their issues. Yeah. And even, uh, you know, even Urdu books are studied in, um, you know, like, for example, in India, uh, Pakistan, and other places. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the same thing, uh, like you mentioned, uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, like, considered bad that you you are not studying this in Arabic, but yeah. it could be just to familiar, uh, familiarize yourself with the academic literature and uh, the technical jargon. 100%. I mean, they don't consider it bad that they're writing in English. So it's we, we, we're going to be playing a game where in we, we say, nope, we won't engage with you guys at all. And we that can work as well to some degree. Sometimes if you... Yeah. Uh, we, we don't even want the students to know about it but I just think with the global world that we're living in It's only so long you'll be able to kind of avoid mentioning their names At one point the students are going to find out that There is actually a book written by an academic on this topic With all these fancy words and jargon That kind of refutes everything that I understood in class So before he gets to that stage It might be good to already address it in class um, and this whole language barrier, like you said, yeah. is very important. In the UK, we're having this issue because a lot of the youngsters don't actually know Urdu. I mean, it's the reality of the situation. We we are reaching that generation where that that early generation where we used to do, for example, us guys, we did, uh, we learned Urdu through Talim. Like we'd say in the Talim and you'd, you'd read as a sheikh, fadail amal, etc. And you'd, you'd learn it like that. Um, nowadays, you know, the Talim, the, the, they might still be doing fadail amal, by the way, but it's in English. Yeah. And our kids do not know, um, a lot of our children don't know Urdu. So we've got a challenge where should we force the language down their throat mm -hmm. or should we kind of compromise and, say, and uh, the, at the expense of their deen, by the way, because they will get bored and they could leave the whole maktab education system. Or should we say, OK, look, we'll take an L on, as we say, on the language. And instead, let's focus on their deen. The, the most important is deen. And yeah. deen is not restricted to a language. If it is, then it's to Arabic. And we will teach them the Arabic, inshallah. And, the, yeah, and the also, Arabic. there's uh, the good thing is, like, there's there's already actually a lot of responses to these Orientalists. Um, so, you know, they just have to study um, uh, our ulama who've already written responses. And, 100%. And our tradition is so strong, uh, subhanAllah, that uh, there's no reason to hide, like, it's just like come out and learn and uh i mean you'll just be like uh you know like a warrior it's it's very easy to uh destroy their their uh, attacks and criticism yeah 100% and this has been proven by the way through like if we look at their research as well we had for example one of their early writers um Golzaya and Shah and all of these guys their ideas were refuted by themselves like their own so later on we had the likes of Motsky and all of these guys who came along and refuted their own you could say tradition so to speak and if you look at it, the, the, they used our books. They just they used better sources. So all the sources we had available. to. So this brings me back to the, the discussion on the Hadith book, which is we need to know our books. We need to know what's out there. Um, and at, in the Muqaddimah of this book, I mentioned a point which I think is quite important, that if you're a fantastic builder um, and you know, you, you've got all the abilities in the world to create the most beautiful land, uh, you know, sky, skyline, or whatever they call the big buildings, um, you've got a, you, you're an absolute amazing architect, but you've not got the equipment with you, or you don't know how to use the equipment that you have. Um, you're brilliant at your job, but you you kind of don't have any equipment with you. How are you going to build that building? So in the same sense, 
if a student can have an absolutely incredible ability um, in terms of his understanding, his faham and his fiqh is incredible, but he actually doesn't know the books out there that he could use to kind of, you know, come up with something, uh, come up with an argument, come up with a type of way to defend a certain argument. So this is what this book is trying to do. It's trying to introduce you to other books. It doesn't kind of give you the food or it doesn't spoon feed you. It kind of shows you where that spoon is, if that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of ilm is just showing you where to find it. As a matter of fact, even uh, Goldzire or whatever his name was, he was I think he was refuted by Ajaj al-Khatib in as well. Yes, as well. yes. So like, and in <laughs> Mustafa Sibai in his Sunnah wa Makanatu of Tashri al Islam, he actually met Shacht. So he uh, actually visited the UK. I think he, he saw him in the UK or somewhere, I don't know, one of the universities in, I think, Edinburgh, somewhere like that, somewhere in Scotland, I think. I could be wrong on that, by the way. Um, but he met him. He actually met him and he debated him on one of the issues. I think it was, that's the one, yeah. On Ibn Shahab al Zuhri, I think he debated him on that. And Shah just became silent. Um, again, we can't be in a bubble where we think we were always right and we'll always, yeah. sometimes you, we, we do need to be honest and think, okay, this is a good argument he's come up with. How yeah. are we going to refute this? Um, and, you know, the, the idea that, oh, but you're not critical enough, you've already decided you want to refute it. That is that is something which as traditionalists, we have to kind of accept will always be there. We will always be muta'asib towards yeah. our, our sunnah and our Quran. And I don't think we need to be critical on that issue. Yeah, also, I think biases will exist. No yeah, matter who, 100%. Who you are. Also, one, one other thing I kind of want to uh, address or mention here, or ask you, um, when, when people hear us saying, okay, for example, uh, you know, uh, we're not critical enough with the uh, teachers or this or that, sometimes people, they get this vibe, they feel that, uh, okay, they're trying, uh, you know, the, the Islamic tradition is uh, it's just like kind of blind following and mm -hmm. now with while after they've interacted with the Western tradition now they're getting this kind of they're trying to incorporate uh, you know criticality or something into their own mm -hmm. uh, you know processes okay. if you will so can you clarify you yeah. know or, so or I, I, think, I think one of the examples I used to refute this and um, it, it sounds a bit controversial and I know orientalists again make a big fuss out of this but I think the example of Umar radiallahu anhu is probably the best <laughs> example we have at least about five examples if not more there's a full book written on this Muwafaqatu um, Umar ibn al-Khattab this is Wafaqtu Rabbi fi Thalath um, but there are more he actually like Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was intending to perform author. yeah Imam Suyuti I think wrote that uh the, the yeah, uh, th there is one I think by Abdul Jawad Hammam as well. Oh, okay. But the the suit is probably written one that I'm not aware of as well. But Umar ibn al-Khattab is probably the best example. Like, wala uh, tusalli ala ahadim minhum ma ta'abadun wala taqum ala qabri. Based upon, again, I'm just going by what I remember of the hadith. So please, please feel free to correct me. If I'm not mistaken, in that hadith, I think Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going to perform salah on that munafiq, mm -hmm. um, uh, on Abdullah ibn Ubay. And Umar actually decided, I'm not, I, I don't think that's the right decision. And this is where the whole question comes in of and that, that's something i discuss in the hanafi book that this whole idea of umar radiallahu anhu they say was um a lot of scholars have said this by the way and this is includes mustafa zarqa in his al-madkhal al fiqhi al he says umar was the first one you could say to lay the foundations of you could say the ahlul ra'i and ahlul ra'i are quite clearly you could say a very critical way of uh, the, the, their approach is very critical they you know, our whole tradition is filled with قَدْ تَرَكْتَ قَوْلَكْ أَرَأَيْتَ هَذَا You know, you pick up Al-Asl of Imam Muhammad, pick up any fiqh book as well. It's always about questioning. The whole book of Al-Asl is full of questions. He's asking Imam Muhammad, or Imam Muhammad is asking himself, depending on how you understand what, who the questioner is. Um, in these fiqh books, they, they are constantly questioning their teacher. Like, why are you holding this opinion where in this masla you held this? So it's all critical. Um, we're already very critical. Yeah, yes, there was a culture of debate, right? Like, why, why did you... Uh, why uh, why are you not consistent with your principle and it was always like the talk was on print on the level yeah. of principle rather than and and i would say it works the other way around how critical are they so um there was a book um if you pick up i've got it there i'm not going to reach out for it but on shakh's origins of uh, muhammadan jurisprudence by sheikh mustafa al-adami in the first page in the footnotes he mentions a story of a certain research i think it was uh, amin al-masri he wanted to write a critique on shakh's book so he applied for a PhD at, I think he said, um, some university. And the other one was Cambridge. I definitely remember Cambridge is in there. And both of those, his application was not accepted. He was not allowed to 
critically review Sheikh's thesis. And I remember when Sheikh Nizam al Yaqubi he came here to uh, to our institute, and you know he was speaking to us about this whole issue. He was saying in his PhD thesis, and when he was writing his thesis, and I think that was at McGill or something like that. I forgot the, or I think it was some university in in uh, in the UK. Um, he was saying that every time he'd write something critical about Shah or something, it's like his supervisor was like on on edge. Like, mm. like he'd have to verbalize it really carefully, and it's like you know. So it's 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 easy for them to say that we're the biased ones, but mm. they have so many assumptions and so many kind of pre biases that they remember they're already coming in with a bias, which is that Muhammad is not a prophet of God. They don't say that, but yeah, that is a bias right. that they have already made <clears throat> without them even speaking. They've already, without even starting a dialogue with them, we are no we know that they are not Muslim. So. Biases will, will always be there. Um, there will be some small amount of biases, and then we'll have to start discussing on those issues where we can be a bit more critical. Uh, so I think it's very important that we already have certain things that we will not budge on, and we will do everything we can to defend it. And then, yes, certain other issues we will address it, and you know we will defend it uh, if we need to, and we will then admit it on certain issues if we need to. So, Muftis, I want to kind of uh, we have gone into. Uh, pretty much of a tangent. I just want to yeah, get no some of these questions. I know a lot of people are yeah, going to sure. want to have uh, some sort of answers. So I'm just going to give the next question. And that is that in your in your book, uh, we kind of had a view of the table of contents. Yeah. And you shared it with us earlier. Um, so you had in the table of contents, you did mention the five stages of hadith codification. Maybe like in summary, if you could just kind of go over the yeah. five yeah. stages so, of the hadith codification that for the yeah. viewers. Inshallah. So what I'll just do before this, I'll just share the screen, inshallah. Yeah. And hopefully it should turn up on your screen. Um, we did kind of look at this just now. Um, so I'm just going to try to share the screen if it allows me to. And I want to try, if I can't put it on the screen. I don't know if that's turning up on your side, Mosab. Oh, Mosab, I think you have to share it or something. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, you're sharing the wrong thing. Um, let me know when you're ready for me to add it. I'm not sure exactly right. Um, well, we did just do it just now, so let me try that one more time. I did learn it pretty well. Uh, let me try that one more time. Present, share screen. If it doesn't work, I'll just speak from my sure. Inshallah, hopefully, this works. Bismillah. Uh, I'm seeing your uh, the screen, your sh it's not the right window, it's not the right window. Okay, um. Stop sharing. I'm gonna try that one more time or something, and then yeah. we'll, I'll just kind of just. You might need to just do uh, share entire screen and then just have Ent that entire one. screen. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let me try that. Is that working now, Musab? Oh no, you have to. Uh, I don't know if you uh, have to switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Is it working now? Yes. If you yeah. just make that maximize that window, maybe. Yep. Yeah, sure. I will do. Perfect. Um, no. I, I, just as I'm sharing, I can't see you guys. So, um, you know, inshallah, hopefully you can still see me. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to turn. So, this is from page 23 of the book. And I'm just going to turn it sideways so we can, inshallah, zoom in a little bit as well. So, I'm going to kind of briefly summarize exactly how we feel, Wallahu alam, that codification and tadween of hadith essentially happen. And I'll try to touch on certain issues and certain topics that I think, inshallah, will address certain uh, questions that you might already have in your mind. So in the first century, um, we need to look at exactly what era is this. So if we look at up until about 80 Hijri, we notice that the, the landscape suggests that there was a high reliance on memory. And this is something that you will find in our books of Tadween as well. They mentioned in our books of Hadith, you find there are loads. And I've put these stories, by the way, inside the book of Hadith. I want to just put one story if I can. Um, and I've got it here with me, so I'm just gonna I'm, I'm gonna just quote this uh, one incident that's recorded in Sunnah Dawood. So this is a story about um, a Bedouin, right? Um, I can just present it. Bear with me one moment. So we've got we've got this story where uh, Ismail ibn Ulayya, he's he's saying that he heard a Bedouin man record a hadith from Abu Huraira. Uh, عنه, attributed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he heard, and by the way, this adds to the whole idea that I've put in this book of the critical nature of the muhaddithun. Uh -huh. So Ismail ibn Ulayya hears a Bedouin record a hadith from Abu Hurairah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He hears the Bedouin. So now, 
if it was if it was kind of showing if the i just want to my mind is going in different places i just want to address one more issue i am using right now a hadith to prove kind of the hadith if that makes sense it's a circular argument right yeah. um how do you know this hadith is accurate then so that so i want to just clarify that by saying i want to get out of the circle and i want to show that there's consistency within the circle I, we don't find something, the only inconsistency which we're going to come to is obviously those ahadith which tell us not to write down ahadith. Uh-huh. That is inconsistency. That is the circle breaking the circle, so to speak. But I just want to show here, like all of these ahadith kind of supplement the idea that the circle within the circle, like the, it, it supports itself in, in the sense that there's no contradiction. So we have this statement he hears from the Bedouin attributing it to Abu Hudra to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, ذَهَبْتُ أُعِيدُ عَلَى الرَّجُلِ الْأَعْرَابِ وَأَنْذُرُ لَعَلَّهِ he says, I went back, I thought, let me ask him, are you sure you heard this from the Prophet? He says, فَقَالَ يَبْنَ أَخِي This Bedouin tells him, أَتَظُنُّ أَنِّي لَمْ أَحْفَظُهُ Do you think I don't, re- do you think I, I don't remember? لَقَدْ حَجَجْتُ سِتِينَ حَجَّةً مَا مِنْهَا حَجَّةٌ إِلَّا وَأَنَا أَعْرِفُ الْبَعِيرَ الَّذِي حَجَجْتُ عَلَيْهِ <laughs> now, I've, done seven, I've done 60 Hajj I, I remember exactly the camel that I used to do Hajj upon every single one of those And then we have loads of stories We have stories, for example, Abdullah ibn Abbas When he heard a poem that had about 80 stanzas within it He says, Wallahi ma sami'tuha illa sa'ati hadhi Walaw shi'tu an aruddaha la radadduha We have the famous story of uh, Marwan and uh, Abu Khudra could, could, could you translate that? That was beautiful um, Yeah, 100% He says uh, when he, when those when that poetry was read to him, he says, "Wallahi, this is the first time I'm hearing this poetry, um, and I, I you know, I, if I was to be asked to repeat it, I could repeat it right now, like from the top of my head." And and actually, one question on this: so a lot of people yeah. might might think like, were these like a savants, basically like indiv- like one in a million type of people, or was this kind of more so, normal so, back then because of some very conditions? good question. So this is something that I've also kind of spoken about in the book. So in Mullah Manazir Ahsan Ghilani's book, Tadween al-Hadith, and I've quoted his exact uh, statement, he addresses this and he says that, look, what was it wasn't they were like superhumans or something and then like mm-hmm. memory just started to uh, decrease suddenly. It's more to do with, like you could say, the environmental situation. If you've not got that many writing material, you've not got um, the ability to write so much. You are going to have to rely on memory. You have no choice. And every community and every nation wants to prosper. And it doesn't just want to forget its kind of statements of its fathers and forefathers. You want to remember it. But you've not got anything to write it down. So what will you naturally rely upon? You will naturally rely upon your memory. A good example of this, by the way, is in, in Mullah Manadir gives this example. And I've put it in the book, which is that... Um, to, if we hear about the travels that they used to do in the past I mean sometimes we don't even need to go so much into the past Sometimes I hear my dad tell me about some of the things they did in their hajj And I'm just like how did you guys do that? Like I would never do that I, I could never do that walk Like that's impossible um, I would just take the taxi because it's just there It's easy for, And to the extent that if that taxi was not there I'd, I wouldn't do it I just wouldn't take that So Mulla Manadir says that if we look at the journeys taken by the muhaddithun of the past in this day and age, we can't even comprehend it or forget comprehend it. We wouldn't do it because we've got we've got cars and we've got like conveyances that take us to all of these places really fast. We've got airplanes, so for us it sounds absurd. But they at that in those times that was the only available tool that they had, so they would use that. A good example in this day and age, I don't know again if there's any if there's any research to prove this, but just based on like anecdotal evidence now here, um, if you go to a certain place like Mauritania. Um, it's kind of known a little bit there that those scholars memorize everything. Mm. Could there be an influence of the fact that in Mauritania, again, I have no evidence for this at all. So if someone wants to critique it, they're more than welcome to, and I could be wrong. But I'm assuming, and it seems like Mauritania is quite quite a poor country, like third world to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, could it be the fact that they don't have actually access to a lot of, you know, you could say writing material or they purposefully don't give themselves access to that or whatever the situation is that impacting their ability to memorize because Mullah Manadir Asam Gilani creates the impression that memory is like a muscle. Um, yes. You can't start lifting, you could say 50 kilograms um, in one day. No one walks into a gym and just lifts 50 kilograms. You start off with like, and then there's this element of like, you know, progressively increasing the amount of weight you can lift. So this is the kind of idea that you know that we could say with the muhaddithun that their memories were genuinely better i i don't think you can deny that based on these stories unless you obviously deny the story itself 
which is back to that whole circular. Another thing. another couple of things that come to mind is like uh, you know before smartphones, like I lived myself yes. when uh, you know, for example, memorizing phone numbers or memorizing directions. 100%. So people knew like entire like the, their whole village's phone number, right? Yeah. Uh, but now you don't remember anybody's. You're lucky if you remember your own. Hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, we've now yeah. got like uh, we've got notepads and stuff like that. So yeah. you know, some people they they remember things so well because they don't use any of this stuff. They don't use any of those it. things. And and even uh, what you mentioned about like the 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 it's like a memory or sorry, it's like a muscle. It's it's uh it's we still see it by uh, because people who do hifz al Quran. I'm sure like uh, you're a hafiz. I'm a hafiz. Yeah. Uh, so the, the first day uh, you cannot memorize a page, right? Yeah. But then by the end, there are people who are memorizing 100%. 10 pages, the half a juz, right? There's people 100%. who memorize one juz. Yeah, and then when you, for example, like, uh, especially if you know Arabic, now add add into the mix that you understand the language. Uh, without understanding the language, I know people who memorized one juz uh, at once towards the end. So now you understand the language also. And uh, you can just maybe hear something once and it'll be, it'll stick. Yeah, I think that's an important point that you, it's not only that uh, because of the societal reliance on memory being a poem that doesn't write in any way, mm -hmm. but then you add to it the fact that they had an interest and then they had, they've had they been doing it for so long and then they, so and, and there's repetition involved and there's so much going into it. So. Yep. It's not. It's not actually a far-fetched idea that there there would be a palm or a group of people that would have this immaculate or you know very strong memories. Hundred percent. And I've I've actually gathered a number of stories, especially in the footnotes of Muhaddithun, who did literally memorize so many narrations that yeah. it, it was kind of like you you look at that number and you 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 just think this is absolutely crazy. Um. So. They were definitely like ahead of us in terms of memory. Again, I don't know. I've not uh, on in terms of like the academia and the academic yeah. research on this. I've not read so much into it. Um, I've in the sense that in carrying on the tradition, Garrett Davidson, he doesn't really, to the best of my knowledge, touch on this whole memory idea. Um, but if obviously other people may know about some research on this, they can inshallah discuss it. Uh, in terms of pers type of codification that was happening in that early period it was actually personal compilation. So no one was actually writing a book like how I'm writing a book right now uh, or in this book. It was basically just like personal notes. You could say like what you're writing down in class when, you're, when your teacher is teaching, this is essentially what they were doing. And even that, if that, if even that, because of the material they had, they didn't really have paper. They had stuff like parchment and, you know, stuff like they were writing on bark and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There's a book on this, by the way, that I have used. Um, this is probably one of the English books that I would say is a really good book. Um, paper before print by Jonathan Bloom, which I used, and I didn't read the full book again. I need to clarify. I read the first fifty pages, and that is, I think, enough to be honest with you to kind of get a good picture of exactly what was being used in terms of um, the qirtas, etc., that they were using um, uh, in the first. Uh, and this is important for Quranic writing as well and the Quranic uh, compilation because those are kind of going to be the similar material that they were writing the Quran on as well. Uh, in terms of content, obviously, narrations, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is alive. You're essentially hearing the Prophet. And there was no ordering because it's all your personal notes. Whatever he says on that day, you kind of write it down or you memorize it. And the whole, if you were writing, it was simply to aid with narrating and memorizing. It wasn't done. And this is something that Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali mentions in his Shara Ilal. And I've quoted it inside the book as well, that it was mainly for the purpose of uh, narrating and memorizing. It wasn't for the purpose of, you could say, uh, you know, uh, making it public for the whole world to kind of see it was their own personal notes and this is something we're going to come across um, because one of the issues we, we need to discuss is how do we di differentiate between the fact that uh, we have got this early writing we've got evidence for early writing and Mustafa al in his studies in early hadith literature presents loads of evidence wherein we can see personal writing by the Sahaba being done mm -hmm. but Later on, at that, at that around about this time, we also have a hadith where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling the Sahaba not to write anything. So I want to kind of just address that right now. And then we have later on Sahaba themselves still telling people not to write. Why is that? So this is a good book that I want to kind of like draw attention to. I don't know if you guys can see because I'm just looking at this uh, uh you know, Window, page yeah. in front of me. I don't know if you guys can see this book. This is a Mothuqiyat to Sunnah Aqlan. Can you bring it uh, close to the camera for a second? Yep, sure. Mothuqiyat to Sunnah Aqlan uh, by Rida Zaidan. 
Um, so this is this is a decent book. It's a hard read for the first few parts anyway. Um, but the remaining parts, the last few parts are brilliant. He explains that, look, what the Prophet Sallallahu was doing was essentially constantly ensuring that the status of the Qur'an always stays one step ahead of the status of the hadith. And this is really unique of, of, about Islam. We are, I don't know if there's another religion that does it as well as we do, which is that distinction between the statements of the Prophet and the statements of the Qur'an. I think this is not something which no Orientalist can deny, that mm -hmm. when it comes to the Qur'an, we there is no ikhtilaf. There is, I mean, look, there will always be some minute here and there, if you want, but there's no major ikhtilaf over hold on, was this a Quranic verse or was this a prophetic statement? Uh -huh. um, they either openly will deny all the prophetic statements like the likes of Shah, etc., who you know deny everything more or less. And then you'll have some who will accept certain hadith. But you will find none of them kind of refuting the idea that this is the Quran and this is supposedly a hadith. And this is what the Prophet was trying to maintain. If you notice some of the other religions, Jews, Christians, the, you, the, the Bible is full of, you could say, stories that, you know, this is not God speaking anymore. This is just basically um, just random stories of, I don't know, pious people to that to that level. So the Prophet was essentially ensuring that once the Sahaba had understood what is the Quran and what is not the Quran, um, and this is another point where you could say Orientalists picked up on that. Are you essentially, because by saying that the, uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted the Sahaba to he wanted them to make sure that they understand this is not the Quran and this is the Quran you are essentially attacking the Quran why? you are saying the Quran's writing or the way the Quran speaks is not a mu'jiza enough and the Quran itself says Am um, again and again the Quran says Am you know, if, if, you if you're saying I've fabricated these try to bring any words or sentences similar to the Quran you won't be able to do it so in one sentence, you are attacking the Qur'an and trying to preserve the hadith. That's their argument. Why? You are essentially saying that the Prophet ﷺ was telling the Sahaba, you won't be able to distinguish the Qur'an from my writing and my statements. So therefore, yeah. make sure you don't write this down because it's actually the it's actually my statements and it's not the Qur'an. That's they, What they're saying is that is quite dangerous because essentially, you're saying the Qur'an can be copied. And the Prophet was worried that his statements would be copied and therefore he told them. So this is a question that, you know, it's a common question which I've addressed in this book as well. And this book does a good job of addressing it as well. And that it was nothing really to do with um, ikhtilatul Qur'an bil ahadith, which is not exactly the right word to use. It's actually to do with mudahat. So this is the exact wording that Khatib al-Baghdadi uses. And by the way, there's a full book written by Khatib on this topic. And his wording is, I think, better Allahu alam, than Hafidh al-Dhahabi's wording. So this is uh, al-Khatib's book, Taqeed al-Ilm. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole book written essentially on the topic of, and this is a book I use quite a bit, um, on the writing of a hadith and you know those hadith which say that you shouldn't write and how to make sense of them. So he says that the nahi was li Allah yudahi that it does not have the same authority as the Qur'an. It, the Sahaba were clearly able to distinguish that this is the Qur'an and this is the Ahadith. But if the Prophet also made them write both of them down, essentially what would have happened is that they would have understood that we need to basically recite the statements of the Prophet in Salah. The, yeah. the level of authority, I, I don't know if um, you're able to kind of follow my thought here, which is that the level of authority given to the uh, Qur'an is not the same as saying that it's going to be mixed up with something else. What we're saying is that the Sahaba were able to distinguish the Qur'an from the Sunnah, from the wording itself, because the Quranic Arabic, they would pick it up straight with. This is unique. This is something mu'jiz. But it was the fact that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give extra attention to the Qur'an, that mm -hmm. write this down. Write this down because this is going to be read, read in your salah. This is this is the wording is exactly needs to be. Whereas my statements, you can do riwayah bil ma'na of them. This you can't. So that is the kind of idea that the Prophet So it to wasn't do. so just for the audience, so that it wasn't uh, necessarily for the sake of distinguishing Quran from Hadith. It was for the sake of uh, setting up the so that it doesn't challenge Quran as something of equal uh, weight or measure. Setting the epistemological hierarchy. Hundred yes. percent, because the Quran is the Quran, lafdan wa both the, both the lafd and the ma'na is Quran basically. Word and Whereas meaning. with the Sunnah, um, most muhaddisun agree that the ma'na is most important. Not to say that the lafd isn't, yeah. um, but the ma'na is definitely the the crux is the ma'na. Um, 
so that's the key idea of why can you uh, can you say love and mana what they mean in english yeah love is the actual wording of the quran and the mana is the meaning of the quran both of them are important so you can't just say oh i'm going to get across the meaning of the quran but i'm just going to read it in slightly different wording is that okay no it's not the quran you have to read exactly that wording so that's why the prophet ﷺ was making them write that down and another point why was he making them write down just because their memory was really good doesn't mean it was infallible it doesn't mean they would never forget anything that is also a, that's mustahil that you know there was no one in that arab early period who forgot anything ever that's that's not possible like it's 100% there is a imkan is mumkin is ja is aqlan for them to forget something so that's why he made them write down the quran and the ahadith so those are all the kind of like key reasons uh are that you know Nabi Sallallahu but then the question comes so now i'm going to move to stage two now so you've got approximately 80 hijri to 120 oh, hijri Masa, which is now share on the screen okay there we go is it is it not shared Musa? no it's shared. no it's shared. oh sorry um so uh we're going to move on to number two and i'm going to come across now the whole issue of okay if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did he initially by the way stopped the writing and then once he realized that the sahaba have understood the authority of the quran he let them do personal writing okay then why do we have statements recorded in this book of khatib mm -hmm. quite literally of sahaba who also stopping tabi'un from writing how, how, like this is a contradiction you just said the sahaba understood the authority so then the prophet let them write but then we got sahaba stopping the tabi'un so had they understood the authority or not because do you understand like yeah. I, I don't know if the, the ishqal is making sense the, the contradiction there mm -hmm. that you are saying the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not let them initially write because of the possibility of them getting confused with the authority of the quran then once they had understood that he allowed the writing personal writing okay then why did then those same sahaba not let the tabi'un write if the authority had now been understood amongst the ummah what was the need to stop the next generation mm -hmm. um so that answer is also given in this book, so to speak. Um, but before I come to that answer, let's just look at what was essentially happening. Um, well, it does fall under that first century because most of the Sahaba are in that. So I'll just mention the answer just now as well, which is that, and again, this is coming from here, as well as Sheikh Mustafa Al-Azami, he, he also mentions this, that the word kitaba in Arabic is very vague in the sense that it has a very generic meaning. It can mean a personal book, and it can mean a proper official book that you're planning to use as like your, how can I say, like this book here that I've written or any book. Like this is a proper official book. This is not Radha Zaydan's or however you say his name. This is not his notes. This, this is a proper book he sent to the publisher. That, those, of, those two types are referred to with the same word in Arabic, kitaba. Mm -hmm. So the Sahaba, the kitaba that they were stopping the Tabi'un from writing was not the kitaba. That the Prophet ﷺ prohibited. The Prophet ﷺ initially prohibited personal writing. The Sahaba, when they were prohibiting, they were prohibiting the official writing. Why? Because the tadween of the hadith has to be one step behind the tadween of the Quran, mm. if that makes sense. So in the Prophet's time, the Quran is being written, and therefore the he said initially Nabi ﷺ doesn't allow any writing. Then once the Quran is more or less more or less written, he now starts to allow, you could say, the writing of a hadith. But for personal reasons, just like you personal, he still encourages memory, by the way. He he says uh, uh, loads of hadith, uh, you know, again, am I, I'm proving a hadith using a hadith. But I'm just trying to show the internal consistency. We have loads of hadith encouraging memorization of a hadith, so to speak. So he still encourages memory, but he allows personal writing. Then in the time of the Sahaba, we now notice official tadween of the Quran is starting to happen. Especially during the time of, you could say, um, Uthman radiallahu anhu, um, you know, uh, uh, before that, obviously, the Quran is officially written as well. And then Uthman does the role of kind of sending out the official mushaf, etc. So if the hadith is doing the same thing, if the hadith are also being written in the form of, a, people could again get, they could get confused, not because of the wording, because Quran is mu'jiz. Uh, most of the Arabs would probably still recognize this is Quran and this, but the authority. Again, the authority would, would become confused. Like, okay, so hold on. Do we read the Prophet's words in a hadith as well now? Or in our salah as well? Or should, uh, should the Prophet's words also be treated? Or we can't touch it without wudu? Or we can't. So all of these legal implications. So in order to avoid that, the Sahaba allowed personal writings. Just like the Prophet did. What they were prohibiting when they said the word kitaba. And it's because of that word kitaba 
that creates the impression that they were prohibiting exactly the same thing that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited. No, they were prohibiting, you could say, more you could like official, an official book because the Quran was at that stage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we don't want that mudahat happening, happening again. And there's an evidence of this, by the way, and I'm just going to quote it uh, from two Sahaba, um, if I can. We've got one from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and this is uh, this is recorded in. If I can just bear with me for one moment, if you can. Uh, it's basically in. Uh, it is in Adarami Sunan, right? Um, uh, I've kind of lost it now, so I'm not going to waste time in trying to find it. But essentially, he is he is kind of saying that that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he comes into the gathering, he comes into the masjid, and he sees a group of people kind of like sitting around a book of hadith. Um, and another example of this, is, by the way, is Umar radiallahu burning, so to speak, burning a book of hadith. Was he burning a personal compilation or like a personal writing or personal notes? Highly unlikely. Most likely he was burning a book that someone had written as an official book of hadith. Like they were trying to like use it in lessons to kind of like, and then, you know, like you a write it down. basically. Yes, a proper publication. And mm -hmm. so then when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, so that's basically, um, yeah, I found the narration. So, uh, Umar radiallahu story is applying to that same scenario And the evidence for that is a situation of Abdullah Masood The story of Abdullah Masood He comes across a group of people And again, what am I trying to prove here Just so that we don't lose track of what we're discussing We're trying to prove that the Sahaba were prohibiting the writing of an official book Not personal writing So that it does not challenge the authority of the Quran Not the wording of the Quran Everyone knew that the writing of the Quran is mu'jiz That this is a special Again, these are just there are there is much more nuance to this, but this is an idea and a theory. Definitely, um, there could be a bit more to this, and it's not black and white as well. But Abdullah ibn Masud radiallahu he takes that book from that group of people from that uh, that are sitting with this book of hadith, and he 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 kind of destroys it, right? And then he says, and this hadith, by the way, is in Sunan Darumi. It's hadith number four eight two. إنما هلك أهل الكتاب قبلكم أنهم أقبلوا على كتب علمائهم وتركوا كتاب ربهم. Indeed, the people of the book before you were destroyed due to the fact that they turned to the books of their scholars and abandoned the book of their Lord. Right? Yeah, this is that narration where he washes it out and he, I think he burns it afterwards or he buries it. Hundred percent. Another similar statement is recorded from Abu Musa Al Ashari, radiyallahu anhu. Again, this is all from the book, and this is also in Sunan Darmi, Hadith number four nine five. So we, you can see, he's he's trying to stop the taraku kitab rabbihim. They abandon the book of their Lord. I.e., the authority given to the Quran is not the same anymore, and it's kind of muddled with the hadith. So that's what they were kind of trying to stop. Um, so the, the tadween of the Sunnah is one step behind the tadween of the Quran, if that makes sense, and that reflects the authority of the Quran. And the Sunnah, but we do have a hierarchy, don't we? we? We have a hierarchy of the Quran first and then the Sunnah in that order. So that hierarchy was kind of maintained, subhanAllah, by Nabi Sallallahu himself, by, you know, by divine, you could say, intervention, quite literally. And I discussed that in the book, that this is also part of inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu That this is how Allah Ta'ala, not only did he preserve the Quran, um, but he kind of preserved the hierarchy of the Quran yeah. That the Quran is separated from the ahadith Now whether the ahadith are authentic or not One thing you can never deny Is that the ahadith are separated from the Quran Nobody has any debate over that But moving on to the second uh, era We have this uh, period between approximately 80 Hijri And by the way, this is a good example by the way, Of me simplifying stuff So I know this sounds really dumb And I'm sure someone watching this is going to probably think Wow, how how foolish But I've had experience not only with myself, but with students where even first century Hijri, or let's just say if I said ninth century Hijri, sometimes students think that that means 900 to 1000, uh, 1000 Hijri, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. uh, it, right? Whereas it's 800 to 900. Yeah. So that's why I've just, you know, it, it sounds really dumb, but like I've just put it actually there that it's 80 Hijri to 120 Hijri. And you'll see me do this quite a bit in the book where in, I'll say third century Hijri and then actually just put 200 to 300 AH. Um, right. Because sometimes students need that kind of, and it is the target audience. I need to look after my target audience, which is essentially if you're anything above um, third year, fourth year, fifth year, 
and the final year, obviously, of the Dars al Nizami program. Uh, in this, so in this, from 80 Hijri to 120 Hijri, we notice an influx of writing tools. Uh, we also notice the centers of hadith start to develop. So we've got basically Makkah, uh, uh, Madi Medina mainly, uh, and Kufa and Basra. So those four really stand out. And from them, you could say the two that really do stand out are Medina and Kufa. And for that, I really do want to kind of give a, sh you know, this book is absolutely phenomenal. For, for this whole process itself, and I'm sure everyone probably already knows about this book, but if you don't, and if you're Talibul Ilm, and you're in like, I don't know, fourth year, fifth year, whatever year, um, but you can read Arabic, I would really, really recommend this book. And I benefited from it a lot in this book. Um, من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى البخاري by أحمد سنوبر. so he mentions this idea that Kufa, Medina, Basra and مكة were four key centers of learning. and he he uses a statement from علي بن المديني which is a very famous statement and you know I think Mullah will remember as well that some of our satis I used to tell us to kind of memorize this statement because it's so important. the statement of علي بن المديني at the start of his العلل when he says that نظرت إلى الأسانيد he says I looked at the أسانيد and I noticed they revolve around about twelve people and then فلي أهل فلي أهل المدينة so I've quoted that whole statement of علي بن المديني فلي أهل المدينة ولي أهل كوفة ولي أهل مكة ولي so these were you could say the مدارس and for this, how, how does a person become a madar? Now, this is something which I've addressed in the book, and I want to use another book that I kind of use for this a lot. This is Asbabu Irad al Hadith by Bakr Kuzudishli. I'm not sure if I've even uh, I'm pronouncing that name properly, right? But they had to actually put Bob on his name just yeah. so people don't pronounce it wrong. Uh, Bakr Kuzudishli. Uh, he's, I think this was originally in Turkish, and then it was translated by. Again, another Nasrullah Ab Nasrullah Abda. I don't know if that is actually his name, but Asbabu Irad al Hadith. I'm explaining how a person became a madar. What is a madar? It's a pivot. It's basically that point where in the hadith completely spread out. So even even though in the early period, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told the Sahaba to you know journey and take out go far and wide to acquire a hadith. It was in this period, you could say, where that really started to kick up and really, because obviously Muslim lands are being conquered and, you know, more more areas being conquered. So therefore now traveling, you're allowed to travel more and more, especially after the demise of Umar, they used to travel far and wide. Mm. So a madar occurs simply, what is that? A person, before this madar, everyone would be narrating a hadith, not everyone, but largely everyone, except for maybe a few sahaba like Abu Huraira. They would only narrate a hadith if a need, if a need came up. So if, for example, um, a good example he gives in this book, and he uses, by the way, he did Istiqra of Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Um, he read the full book, if I'm not mistaken, he says in Muqadimah, I read the full Musnad Ahmad, and that's a very good source for him to use, by the way. He'll have covered Kutubu Sitta to a large degree as well in there, um, to kind of come up with the conclusions. And this whole book is about what would instigate a Sahabi to narrate a hadith. So he kind of comes to the conclusion that, before this 80 Hijri to about 120 Hijri period, a Sahabi uh, would essentially, and that would mean most of the Sahaba to speak other than Abu Huda, they would only narrate if a need came up or some incident happened or someone asked them a question. Um, that is why, and in this book I also go through common narrators. If you even look at the common narrators of Hadith, when it comes to someone like Nafi', Nafi' is the, you know, he's a common narrator from Ibn Umar. But then Nafi' also has access to so many other Sahaba. But we see him sticking to Ibn Umar. Why? Ibn Umar was from those Sahaba, as according to this scholar here, who would not, he, he you know, he was very, he would not narrate a hadith to you very quickly. So if you've come to him to acquire a hadith, guess what? You're going to have to accompany him for a long time. You're going to have to be with him for about good, good 10, 15 years. And that's why we noticed that mulazamatul muhaddith happening quite a bit in this period as well, uh, before this period, where you know, he spent so long with this muhadith and then he acquired a decent amount of a hadith from him. So if you're with him, you can't be with you can't be in two places at once. So that's why in the early period we noticed that the common narrators from the Sahaba are kind of a few, you have those few crux, uh, yeah. six, seven common narrators. Whereas those same common narrators, you won't find them in the nether sahabis. Uh, so like for example, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu's common narrator, Abu Sadih, uh, as mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at him, he he had access to other Sahaba, but you see him narrating 
primarily from Abu Huraira, not to say he doesn't narrate from other Sahaba, but he becomes a most common narrator of Abu Huraira. Why does he not go to... So the idea is that he'd have to accompany the other Sahaba for so long, and in that time he could lose out on Abu Huraira. So uh-huh. he thinks, let me just stick to... Because the Sahaba would not narrate except if there was a need. That brings me to the Madar. Madar is where it all changes. And this is where this scholar calls it Riwayatul Hadith al manhajiyah which is now where a muhaddith would actually sit down in a masjid. He'd have his book of hadith. And uh, this is what we're going to come to just ne- uh, next, which is basically that during this period, there was now proper codification of books of hadith, like proper publications. You know that thing that Sahaba didn't want happening in their time? Now it was allowed. For a number of reasons. Some have said it's because of the command of Umar ibn Abdul, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. That's yeah. probably one of the factors. Another factor that has been attributed, and Sanubar in his book is quite adamant that it's not just the command of Umar. Uh, in fact, he critiques that to some degree. He says that's kind of a misconception, but Allah knows best. He says it's more about the availability of tools because we notice Tadween is happening in every field around about 130 Hijri, uh, or about 120 ish approx. When Dhabi says that, you know, so he says, Dhabi, Rahimahullah, kind of says that Tadween fil fiqh wal hadith wal lugha wal ra'i wal. He gives this whole long list. So, how is Tadween happening in all of these fields? It must have been something external to the concept of hadith and Quran as well, which must have been the availability of tools, which kind of goes well with the whole Jonathan Bloom's idea that um, kind of influx of paper um, from the Chinese Buddhists who were, interestingly, based on his conclusions, it was, I think he says that. The Buddhists who had come up with this paper and it was made from mulberry trees. I've mentioned the tree's name in the book. I don't want to misquote it. Um, they had actually made this paper to kind of spread Buddhist teachings. Um, so they wanted the Buddhist teachings to spread. So they had written there. And through the Silk Roads, it kind of made its way into the Muslim world around about this period, which is when now suddenly Muslims start writing proper official books. Uh-huh. And we have, you know, Ibn Juraj fi Makkah and, you know, a number of scholars have held up in it. It was actually Ibn Juraj who started it off. Um, but ala kulli hal, there is some, there's a whole long list of different scholars who started writing. And they all essentially um, were the students of these madars. And these madars were basically, uh, they would sit now in a masjid. This is riwayatul hadith al manhajiyah They would sit in a masjid and they would narrate a hadith, one after the other, essentially. Without a need, and they would not even be sometimes related to anything that's happened in front of them. It would be related to tahara, related to salah, and now this actually in- increases the amount of hadith that are out there. So if we notice after the madar, the hadith spread out everywhere. Well, how? Why does that happen? Because now it's easy to access a hadith. If I know that I can go to Ibn Shahab Zuhri or whatever, and I can basically just I know he holds a gathering in the masjid at five o'clock at this time. I just need to go there and acquire. I'm, I'm gonna make that a rihla fi talab al-ilm. Uh-huh. I don't need to be. I don't need to be a mulazim of him. I don't need to be in an accompany. I don't need to accompany him for like about 15, 16 years to acquire a hadith. He's just gonna give it to me in one go. He's got an actual lesson he's delivering in the masjid. So that leads to more students coming and acquiring a hadith, and the hadith spread out more as well. So that's you know one possibility that obviously this scholar is. Again, I'm not saying because everything we say in this presentation, none of it is. I, I want it to be treated as like, and even this entire book, like as though it's hundred percent, you know, correct. It's it's a theory, and it's a you know, inshallah, uh, correct. To if it's correct, then it's from Allah. Um, so this is essentially this period where now official books are being written, and you could say the man the the riwayatul hadith is now essentially becoming manhaji, which means you're narrating without a need, without a need. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why the way why Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu may have been critiqued, if you remember, by certain sahaba, sahaba who, like Ibn Umar, who didn't like, because he was ahead of his time, if you notice. Abu Hurairah was narrating a hadith without a need. We, you know, So the reason as to why he was critiqued was not because of any trust issues, na'udhu And in fact, Ibn Umar actually says that we trust you. We don't think you're lying, but this is not how the Prophet did it. So you could tell he was ahead of his time, so to speak, Abu Hurairah. In the same way that Abu, Hani- Abu Hanifa, with his Ar-Ra'i, was maybe ahead of his time uh, for the uh, Muhaddithun scholars at that time. But in any case, so after after the Sahaba, you could say, during the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, we have these books of Hadith sort of being written. And no, most I likely... The- in, I want to jump in here... Um... Just because of the time, we did about two stages, right? Yeah. Now, I want to also just cover a few other questions, and I want to um, 
how do you want to do it, Musab? Because I want to yeah. hear the rest of the stages also. <laughs> yeah, um, I, Mullah, I think if you do want to, because we've got more stuff to discuss, and I think if we even leave it a cliffhanger, it could encourage people to actually yeah. read yeah. the book. So yeah, we could have more of it. We could have future. To to yeah, we could have a podcast like uh, only that goes in depth on this uh, yeah, in sure. the future, inshallah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I was, I was actually thinking that myself that this is this is going to end up being too long. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a good idea to kind of just say, well, that is the key part of the doing sort of happening. Yeah. And it's important to kind of, I want to just mention one last point, which is to yeah. distinguish between writing of a hadith and writing an official book of hadith. Those are two separate things. Writing of hadith was happening from the time of the Bissau. It's the official writing of a book that started to mm -hmm. happen, you could say, during this period. And, and after you actually that, covered a lot of questions. I mean, some of yeah. the, a lot of good points were brought up. And I, I really wanted the uh, kind of the audience to get the sense of the depth of this, uh, you know, the, the field of hadith as well and the codification of hadith. And there's a lot of things that people haven't. People yeah. think it's this very simple thing of yes. like, you know, oh, yeah. is this Sahih or Da'if? And then that's it. Yes, yes. No, no. So, inshallah, I do hope that when they read this book, and like I said, there's an online course with it, so I kind of do go yeah. a lot of a lot of uh, deep stuff into this as well. But we can't even, you know, do another podcast if we need to. But you're right, we need to kind of discuss a few other stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's the Tadween, and I think it does touch on the issue of the writing, um, because I, I believe we were going to also discuss a little bit about that, that uh, mm -hmm. the, why did the Sahaba actually not allow writing, so to speak, if we are saying yeah. they did not allow writing? That was actually one of the yeah. questions I had later on, but Alhamdulillah, yeah. you kind of addressed it there. I want to ask another question here, which is, uh, it's also kind of part of your book as well, and maybe um, you could speak to it. Uh, the difference between a hadith and sunnah, and what are the implications of this uh, differentiation? Yeah, I mean, this is another topic that could take about a good three hours to speak, but I'm going to try and as much sure, as possible because, uh, yeah. because I want to cover all of our topics. I'm looking at the time. We've yeah. got a little bit of time. I want to try to cover it in about five, ten minutes. Yes. So I've been thinking about this a lot of how to address this question and what's the best way to think about it. One thing I want to just say off the top of my head is what the sunnah means to one scholar may not be a sunnah to another scholar and that's important to understand that there is no like worldwide definition of what the sunnah is so for abu hanifa rahimahullah what he considered to be the sunnah as we as i'll just mention just now might not always be that which is narrated by bukhari like 200 years later yeah. um so it's not it, it doesn't work like that or even that which is being narrated in his time because i don't want to create the impression that bukhari is just coming up with these hadith mm -hmm. but like even if the Bukhari's, you know, the Bukhari's Sanad is going through the time of Imam Abu Hanifa, so to speak, there is someone who's going to be a contemporary of Abu Hanifa in there. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah's conception of Sunnah, or for that matter, any other scholar, even Imam Malik's, is not going to be the same. It's not going to be like a unified approach. Now, the best way to think of it is, um, I, I, I wish I'd kind of done this before the podcast, but like that, that umum al khusus minwaj, which is like, you've got like a two circles. Like a Venn so diagram. Yeah, a Venn diagram, that's the one, mashallah. Um, so a Venn diagram is the best way to think of it. Some ahadith will definitely be sunnah, uh, many ahadith, um, in the sense that we will say this is the sunnah. Look, it's established in this hadith. It's narrated by this person, from this person, from this person. That's what I mean by hadith, by the way, that it's narrated with a chain of narration and it's going back to the Prophet. So this is the sunnah. So, for example, we might say it is a sunnah to uh, visit the sick. All right, and we've got a hadith when Nabi Sallallahu did that, he encouraged it. He so that's a sunnah. It's if you go to visit a poor person, uh, a person who's not well, sorry, you'd say you have fulfilled the sunnah. Mm -hmm. There will be certain hadith that will not be sunnah. The Prophet Sallallahu is known to have drunk water standing up, right? But that is he did it for a certain reason. So that's an example of a hadith that would not be considered sunnah. Even if you were going to say that it's permissible to drink water standing up, I don't think it's correct and no madhab really says this or no understanding of uh, the sharia says that it's sunnah to drink water standing up. All your water drink is standing up. Stand up even if you're sitting down, stand up and drink your water. Similarly, urinating. We have a hadith, أَتَى سُبَاتَ تَقَوْمٍ فَبَالَ قَائِمًا صلى الله عليه وسلم. So are we now going to say urinating, standing up is sunnah? We clearly say the opposite, right? We say sitting. So not every hadith is sunnah. Um, then we have the final. So we, I've come across there are certain hadith that are sunnah. That, that's in the middle. There are certain hadith that are not sunnah. Can there be a sunnah that's not hadith? 
So that can happen as well. And this is especially true before Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah. So Imam Shafi'i, you could say definitely, and this is where there is a bit of a cross between certain things that Orientalists say as well, because Shah says, he doesn't say this uh, in this exact word. He in, indicates words, but he takes it one step further that before Imam Shafi'i, Sunnah never meant the Sunnah of the Prophet. That's not true. That's not true. Everyone was trying to go back to the Prophet. Remember, the Prophet وسلم, is a historical figure. We are trying to get back to what he did. We do not have, and I sometimes I know this might sound a bit rude, um, but in class I just say we used to have this, you know, when we were kids, there used to be this like Doctor Who type of program where you can jump into a time machine and you can go. We don't have that. So how do we access the Prophet Sallallahu That's what essentially every great scholar of Islam was trying to do. So this idea that, you know, no, no, they were not following the Quran and Sunnah. This is the Quran. Everyone was trying to go back to the Quran and Sunnah. They were all essentially trying to... But it's just that before Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, to a large degree, it wasn't just one way of getting to the Prophet Sallallahu which is through an authentic chain of narration. There were other ways. And that is basically, Imam Malik is essentially living in the time of Tabi'un. Abu Hanifa is living in the time of Tabi'un. If I went to Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and I presented to them a hadith from Bukhari and I said, guess what? You're doing, you're not doing Raful Yadain. So here's a hadith, it's in Bukhari, it's in, here's all the, I went back in my time box or what, or whatever, and I present, they would say to me, well, look, I get it. I get this is an authentic hadith according to you. By the way, we don't know the conditions of an authentic hadith pre-Imam Shafi. We do have some indications, but Imam Shafi definitely based on Ibn Rajab's statement was one of the first ones to articulate what is an authentic hadith. And this has been kind of understood from his Risala. If you look at it, he gives the five conditions. If you said that to Imam Malik, Imam Hanifa, they would say, I get it, but I see everyone not following this. I would see, I can see my companions not doing this. I can see this Sahabi is not doing it, or this Tabi is not doing it, this person is not doing it. Surely there must be some issue with So this is the kind of like um, issue where we've got a Sunnah, where Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, may well establish a Sunnah, but it's if you look at the Ahadith, you would think, this is there is no support for this or it's weak or whatever but it wasn't just a hadith was not the only way to get to prophet sallallahu because they were living in that early time period they had the advantage of living with what we might you know to borrow what shaht calls the living tradition they did have the living tradition and that is that does make a bit of a big difference so the sunnah can also be amal tawaruth um, they saw his companion do it. He saw, so it's more based on senses rather than words because hadith is based on verbalization. Yeah. So again, this book, I'm going to just recommend it again. He's got a discussion. I do apologize. He's got pictures at the front, but uh, he's got a discussion here on the difference between. I'm just going to quote, if you don't mind, just the Arabic and we'll, we'll move on to the next question. He says, I'm going to translate it as well. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to translate the English yeah. essentially what he's saying. That'll be easier. Uh, what he's saying is that Imam Malik was from min kibari atba'i tabi'in. He was from the elderly companions of the tabi'un. And just read the Arabic. He was living in the, like the living sunnah. He was living with the, like, I, how can I explain it? He's living yeah, with the sunnah. he was living at the time where the sunnah yeah. itself was alive. Literally, the sunnah is alive in front of him. So, whereas Imam Shafi'i comes along later and he's, you could say, you could say, taqlidu shafawi in the sense that he's living in a time period far away from mm. that great generation. Not to say not, not tremendously far away. I'm not trying to make it look like he came centuries later, but he did essentially, he was born in the year that Imam Abu Hanifa passed away, which is a big difference if you think about it. That's three tabaqat at least separating them. Um, so the only way for Imam Shafi'i now to get to the Prophet Sallallahu he sees this type of, he says, well, hold on, Kufa, they have their own type of like, you know, they, they, they're they saying that this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Medina said, right, we need to sort this out. We are going to rely upon the authentic ahadith only. Mm. And I think that's this basically... <clears throat> You know, um, like the, in the question I was saying, the what are the implications of this? And I think that people who don't understand this dynamic, the fact that the a lot of Sunnah is established, it's not necessarily always established through uh, narration, especially when you're dealing with the oldest or the you know schools of fiqh and jurisprudence. The implications of that are huge because you have a lot of people nowadays coming and say, "Well, look at the Hanafis; they don't follow the Sunnah. They just yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, can I just also uh, like counter one? Thing that someone could come Perfect. back to me on with this 
one of the things, and it's a common uh, question that someone, you know, sometimes people have, which is that, you know, your, our approach, my approach here, this could actually open the doors for Orientalism to come and attack a hadith. Basically, mm. you're saying because the Hanafis never practiced upon certain ahadith, so therefore that because they felt it contradicted their Kufan tradition or whatever living tradition, yeah. and it, it contradicted another thing that Imam Abu Hanifa is very adamant on. And again, with the Hanafis, it plays a big role is Qawaid Kulliya. So yeah. general principles that Imam Abu Hanifa has understood from the Quran, Sunnah, etc. Loads of ahadith are proving this idea that we need to have justice or this has to be, uh, if you do this, then you, this happens. Then if he comes across a singular hadith that seems to be contradicting this, he will give preference to that system, the whole that large system over the one hadith because he's formulating law and law has to be consistent. Consistent because if you go and park on a double yellow line or what we call like a, a a place where you're not allowed to park and you get a fifty pound fine, but then Allah forbid you do something terrible like you 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 know you punch someone in the face or you and you get like a twenty pound fine. How does that make sense? That that doesn't make sense at all. Mm -hmm. So Imam Abu Hanifa is really eager that our Sharia law that because this is how we view the Prophet. Did he just come to give us random statements? Or did he come with a Sharia law? Did he come as a legislator? So if we just take random statements, you could say, I'm going to drink my water standing up because the Prophet drank water standing up. But if you look at the holistic view, and this is something that, by the way, even Shah Abdul Haq al-Dahlawi, in one of his, I've, I've come across a statement of him saying that the Hanafi approach is like a kulli approach where we look at the hadith, we look at other things as well, general principles, and we look at communal practice, which is the living tradition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And we also look at, the authority and epistemology of the Quran because remember like we said the tadween of the Quran is one step ahead so if we find that the Quran and this is very controversial Ardu Sunnah Adal Quran comparing the Sunnah and is it in line with the Quran and which one should be given preference so just the last last point which is that someone could say and this is something that Dr. Haytham Khazna uh, he's got an article on when he discusses that okay isn't this modernism so tomorrow now I'm going to say well this hadith isn't in line with Sharia I don't like it uh, I'm not going to practice upon this hadith The Hanafis did it And they actually do that There was a person in the UK as well Who would use Imam Malik's approach to the Sunnah To reject the hadith Right So you could say Look there, there's a clear example of how you can misuse uh, it The answer to that I would say is And Dr. Haytham Khazna gives this answer Is that Just because a system can be abused Doesn't mean the system is wrong And it didn't occur It did occur so we just need to find the difference between the way it's being abused and the way it was used correctly. And the difference is the Hanafis only applied this type of criticism towards the text of the Hadith only on issues of fiqh. Whereas the modernists are doing it for miracles. Mm -hmm. They're doing it for, for example, the stone that ran away from Musa salam. They'll start using naqdul matan or they'll critique the text of the Hadith because it doesn't fit with their already kind yeah. of preconceived notion of modernity and how like it doesn't make sense. Um, another thing was that many times the Hanafis are not actually rejecting the hadith. They're just saying we can't practice upon it. They're not concerned. They, you will find the word rad. I won't lie. You will find in the books of Hanafi Madhab, they do say we reject the hadith. But you can tell what they're saying, it, the context they're saying it in is that we're not concerned with whether the Prophet said it or not, but practice is not upon it. And we will not be practicing essentially upon the hadith because it doesn't fall in line with some of the other. So that's what I mean. So the, for them now, the sunnah, has is not with this hadith if that makes sense so yeah, it's like definitely. analyzing uh if i understand correctly it's like analyzing a body of evidence and 95 percent of the evidence points one way and then you have uh five percent maybe just one hadith and you're like okay i don't know was this like an exceptional scenario 100%. i'm not sure how to square the circle with the rest of the body 100%. of evidence but because this is so heavy i'm just going to give this preference 100%. and kind of plead the fifth like for this. and then the question could come then okay then why do you defend the hanafi madhab so much using a hadith why don't you use it well the answer to that is also simple which is that this is the only thing we have i mean the, we are we can't go back in time can we and the only way we can do that is to use imam shafi's approach which is why he's such a genius he he came up with a, with an approach for us to access the prophet 1400 years later which is through uh you know uh, we we require this authentic chain of narration so to speak not to say that the requirement of these authentic that only came into existence during the time of imam shafi it was there before imam shafi but the methodology of how we need to kind of like 
you know, Mustalah al-Hadith. That is why you you can't deny that he is one of the founding fathers of Mustalah al-Hadith, uh, the field of looking at, you know, and correcting, you could say, the chains of narrations of Hadith, etc. Not to say that before, he's obviously building upon the work of the Muhaddithun mm -hmm. that were there before him. Sure. Um, I had one question. So um, you, uh, you remember the Venn diagram that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So doesn't that uh, <clears throat> presuppose the definition of um, Sunnah and Hadith of the Fuqaha? Whereas, for example, if we look at the definition, uh, you know, in the Muhaddithin, uh, wouldn't that be just like an overlap and they would be synonymous, um, uh, Sunnah and Hadith? Um, or is that not the case? It's I wouldn't say exactly because um, when we see the fuqaha using the term sunnah, it is definitely sometimes it seems to be like I said a reference to communal practice. Mm -hmm. We see them referring to ideas about qawaid kulliya. Sometimes we see them critiquing a hadith, and there are examples of this. Critiquing a, uh, just because the mutton for them doesn't make sense. Like it, how could the prophet have done this? Because we have so many other hadith when he. Which, like I said, it opens the door to liberalism and modernism. So, to, to, to okay, he, they did it, we'll do it as well. The matan yeah. doesn't make sense as the text. So, Kawthari's statement in his maqalat, I use it as like a type of kalima dhahabiyya or like a golden statement. He says that there's a, for hadith, there's a sanad and the matan. The fuqaha mm -hmm. have paid more attention to the text than they did to the sanad. Um, and the muhaddithun paid more attention to the sunnah than they did to the text. Now that's a very generic statement, but if you look into it, it kind of it kind of fits very well that they both supplement each other. This one kind of tells you whether the hadith can be practiced upon, and this one kind of tells you is the hadith actually even authentic and can it be ascribed to the Prophet? Um, there is there is a very good article that I really do like by Ahmed Sanubar called Wadifatul Muhaddith al Naqid or Wadifatul Faqih al Usuli, wherein he kind of goes through what's the role of a faqih. And what's the role of a muhaddith? And that a muhaddith is a, is a historian. Mm -hmm. And the faqih is the one who's basically taking all of these hadith along with all of everything else. And he's kind of putting all the ingredients together and he's actually formulating the final product, which is the law, the sharia law with his understanding and his fiqh. Yeah, so the muhaddith is like a data collector and then yeah. the faqih is like a data analyzer. Oh, and so then... that, that antumul, uh, you know, uh, antumul atibba wa nahnu sayyadil. I don't have any issue with that. I know some people, you know, they, they raise an issue with this, that this isn't a correct statement. This is making yeah. the muhaddithun look like some type of... But there are so many stories to support this idea of antumul fuqaha wa nahnu sayyadil. You are the doctors, we are the pharmacists, we provide the... There are so much... They, they, I mean... I, I've I've been doing some research on this and I've found like a number of stories uh, to prove this idea. Antum al fuqaha wa nahnu sayyadila. That the muhaddithun are essentially and the fuqaha look beyond a hadith as well. Sometimes they look at maslah and then that becomes the sunnah, by the way. Yeah. So a good example of this is um, you could say is take something like uh, taking a slight payment for teaching the Quran. Early fuqaha were against it. Later the fuqaha felt there's a need for it. You could go as far as saying, Wallahu alam, again, I, I've not read this, but if someone said that it's sunnah to take remuneration in the sense that it's allowed, it's a part of our sharia, again, sunnah here kind of, because we're looking at it as sunnah to fuqaha, like sunnah wajib mustahab. When I mean sunnah, I mean like in the sense that it's a part of sharia, you're allowed, it's the Prophet, you know, then this wouldn't be far fetched. So, in that sense, Wallahu alam, um, the fuqaha look at all of these extra factors beyond the hadith. And then the law that they formulate that becomes sort sort of so to speak the sunnah. And I've come across, across a lot more examples of this in um, in the Hanafi book and introduction to the Hanafi method, which inshallah should be coming out uh, next year, inshallah. Before I hand it to Imam Asadullah for the next question, I have um, one more question, and uh, uh, that is about Imam Abu Hanifa um, Can you shed light about um, you know there's the um, debate was he a Sahabi? Was he oh, sorry? Was he a Tabi'i or was he not a uh, Tabi'i? Did he meet one Sahabi more than one Sahabi? Um, so I, I don't I don't think there's any debate that he was a Tabi'i in the sense that most uh, other than Adarqutni rahimahullah, uh, most of the other muhaddithun affirm that he saw on a Malik. Um, so he was definitely a Tabi'i uh, based on the definition given by the muhaddithun themselves of what a Tabi'i is that you've seen a Sahabi as a Muslim etc. So he was a tabi'i. I don't think there's any debating that uh, he he precedes Imam Malik in terms of his age, etc. So he, if Imam Malik, uh, Imam Malik, uh, rahimahullah, uh, most likely was he did not, uh, he was not a tabi'i. But I could be wrong on that because I'm not an expert on Imam Malik and I'm not expert on Abu Hanifa as well. But I've read a bit about him, so uh, he was definitely a tabi'i. Did he do riwayah from a Sahabi? Wallahu alam. I think on that one, 
I think the jury is out, but I, I, I'm inclined towards no. Uh, it doesn't seem that he did. And then uh, as salihi which is where this comment of, uh, there's, a, there's a book called Uqudul Juman, Fi Manaqib Abi Hanif al Nu'man by Muhammad ibn Yusuf as salihi This is where he kind of touches on this. He says, I'm, I'm perplexed that he saw a number of Sahaba. Why did he not do any riwayah? So he says, the only answer I can think of is no one kind of encouraged him at that point. He was too young. And that does happen that, you know, you, you, you're you too kind of awestruck to you. Like, it's like when we go and meet like a really senior scholar, you meet him and then it's like you kind of walk out or you, you just sit there for a little while. He's just sitting there and then Chalo Majlis is finished and now we're walking off. He doesn't really say anything. He doesn't teach you anything. He, so to become a student is a different story than to just sit in the companionship of. And the age gap is too big for that person to even give you too much attention. Right? Yes. You're just I, I say that, I say that, Mulna, but then look on the other side, you've got Mulna Abdul Rashid and Nomani, and you've got this whole book written by his son trying to prove that he 100% did do riwaya from a Sahabi. But I'm personally thinking the, mm -hmm. it's going too far. I actually think Allah knows best, but I don't think it, it happened. Sorry, I kind of dropped off uh, my connection. No worries, Mulna, no worries. I didn't. Um, so I guess the next question that I had here, and I, and I think this will kind of. Um, this will need a, a special podcast on its own. It's kind of what are some of the methods used by Hadith scholars and appraising narrations? What are the things they look at? You know, Sanad, Mat, and this, that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely. Uh, so the book, the book if does can, go. If we can make. I, I would just say buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if we can even uh, use like simpler terms for this as much as possible. Yes. Uh, so that the maximum amount of people can benefit. Because this is a key, key point. So I'm going yeah. to actually skip that question because I know that one is kind of a. Uh, it's, that's actually yeah, it's really hard. But if I can just maybe give one story that yeah. can maybe kind of help to explain how the muhaddisun were not sleeping uh -huh. and they were well aware of everything that was going on around them in terms of who they were acquiring a hadith from so one of the methods they used to use and i put this actually in the in the book and i hope people have a bit of a chuckle when they read it um is the process of a talqeen so what they would do is they want to check the two things what are the two ways in which you can recognize someone is making a mistake number one is He's alone in narrating something that no one else is narrating. Like if I tell you a story and I'm the only one telling you a story about it, and it's such a famous, like everyone should be narrating this, that then that's a problem. Or I'm saying something, everyone else is also saying something, but I'm contradicting what they're saying. My story is slightly different. So that's also a problem. So what they would do is they want to check his adala, his reliability, and his memory. Uh, his honesty so to speak and his memory so one of the ways they used to check his memory i'm just going to give this story and i will move on to the next question is a talqeen and talqeen literally means literally means like to give something to someone or to kind of you know force it to them so to speak or present it to them so there's a story of uh ibn ma'in who is a very big muhadith imam ahmed and another student a servant um, they're coming back from their journey of meeting a very big muhaddith called Abdul Razak al sanani And he's got a book called Musannaf So they're on their way back and on the way they stop and they meet another muhaddith called Abu Nu'aim Al-Fadl ibn Dukain And many people will have heard of this story, the scholars will have anyway But if you've not heard of it, it's a very funny story So they, uh, Ibn Ma'in says to Imam Ahmad, I want to test his memory and he's, a, he's a teacher of Bukhari, Abu Nu'aim He's a teacher of Bukhari So uh, so he's their contemporary, so to speak. And Ibn Ma'in and Imam Ahmad are just before Bukhari, by the way. Imam Ahmad obviously is a teacher of Bukhari. Um, so Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, tells Ibn Ma'in, don't do it, man. This guy is like, he's, he's, this is Abu Nu'im. How are you messing with Abu Nu'im? Crazy. He's like, no, no, I have to do it. I have to do it. So they knock on his door and they basically, you know, they say, we want to basically acquire a hadith from you. So how they would do, uh, how they would acquire a hadith is that they would already have Abu Nu'im's hadith with them. Now they would just read those ahadith of Abu Nu'im to him and Abu Nu'im would say, yes, that's my hadith, that's my hadith, yes, yes, correct, correct. Right? So how they would be presenting it is that essentially, if I'm Ibn Ma'in, I'd be reading and I'd say, Haddathana Abu Nu'im qala, Haddathana Abu Nu'im has narrated to us that he has narrated, that his teacher narrated to him, that his teacher narrated to him, that his teacher, that the Prophet Sallallahu said. After I present that, Abu Nu'im would say, Naam, yes, that's correct. So he, you know, you've already technically got the ahadith, you're just now basically doing what we call uh, reading it to the muhadith and he's listening it to and affirming it and giving you the green light. But you want to kind of make sure, I don't want him to just rely on his book, I want him to make sure he's memorized his ahadith or he knows his ahadith very well. So what does Ibn Ma'in do? He does a process of talqeen. He 
he sits in front of Abu Nu'im and he's sitting on a, like a stool, you could say. Uh, and Imam Ahmad sitting next to Abu Nu'im and the other servant is sitting and he's the one relating the incident, by the way. He's sitting on the other side of Abu Nu'im. So Ibn Ma'in starts reading the hadith and then after every 10 hadith, Ibn Ma'in adds in a hadith from his own side. But it's with the same sanad, by the way. It's with the same sanad. It's with the same chain of narration. So he will still read Haddathana Abu Nu'im. Abu Nu'im has narrated to us that his teacher has narrated to him, that his teacher has narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said. And then the, the text of the hadith that he mentions, Abu Nu'im has never heard of this text. Or he has, but he hadn't acquired it from any of his teachers. So then as soon as he narrates that, uh, Abu Nu'im just looks up and he's like, uh, no, that's that's not part of my hadith. I've not got that. Yeah, rub that out. So Ibn Ma'in rubs it out. Okay, no problem. He reads the next 10 now. And after the next 10, everything's fine. He adds one more from his own side. You know, let's just say Abu Na'im didn't have the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ Right? From his own, he did. But from his own teachers, he never had that. So he'll read that hadith from his chain of narration of Abu Na'im reaching to the Prophet Abu Na'im, No, that's not, that's not my chain of narration. Rub it out. He does it one more time and then Abu Na'im clicks on what's going on. I don't know this guy, he's messing about. So then Abu Na'im, his face turns all red. His eyes start bulging. The narration actually says that, that the story, the person who's telling this story. He grabs Imam Ahmad and he says, this man is too pious to do something like this. <laughs> this one next to him, the servant, he's too like, he's too, he's a, you know, he's a poor guy. He's, he's just a servant. This is all your ideas, Abu Nu'im, uh, Ibn Ma'in. And he kicks his stool so that Ibn Ma'in kind of falls down onto the ground. <laughs> after the, after, and then he walks up, he gets up, he's very angry. He walks up, he stands up, walks back into his house and doesn't even greet them. After that, Imam Ahmad says to Ibn Ma'in, didn't I tell you, Alam Akul Lak, did I not tell you that this guy is reliable, his memory is good? And this is the kind of like Mahalu Shahid or the, per, the bit that I want to kind of use as evidence. Ibn Ma'in then says something which should tell us exactly how reliable or how God-fearing or God-consciousness the Muhaddisun had. And this is something that in the Orientalist writings you don't you don't see this coming. In fact, they'll, they'll avoid even using the word lie. You don't even see them attributing the word lie to the Muhaddis. They're all calling them liars, mm. but they know how bad it would look if we constantly said they were lying. But this is what Ibn Ma'in says. He said, Wallahi larif satuhu ahabbu ilayya min safari hadha ila uh, Abdul Razak. To that effect, he says, I swear by Allah, he's kicking my stool is more beloved to me than my entire journey to Abdul Razak. Why? Because I have now got conviction that his narrations are authentic, and basically, my attribution to the Prophet awesome, through Abu Nu'im, I can say, okay, Alhamdulillah, is correct. So, this is the kind of like you know, critical methodology of the Muhaddis. And how, and by the way, this is something that Sanubar mentions in his book. Abu Nu'im is about, I think, at least over 10 years older than Ibn Ma'in. Mm. Most of us would be very scared to kind of do this to a, someone who's over 10 years old, like the cha-cha in the masjid, you wouldn't dare to, you know, mess about with him. So this is Ibn Ma'in and this was the Muhammad. But in the book, there's loads of more stories like that, inshallah. So inshallah, also the, so the next question is something that um, we kind of hear often, and that is that people will say that um, hadith is not really a trustable source, uh, simply because of the existence of fabrications. Uh, and mistakes and weak narrations and that. So how would you, how would you yeah. reply to such a person? A so, for, so to relate to this, um, I think it's related to the previous question. Um, if we can appreciate what that look, lying and fabrications can happen, and that's happened in every you could say tradition. Um, the one thing that I would say is it's not the fact that the, a problem has occurred; it's more the re response to the problem. Mm. If there was no response from the muhaddithun, if they just stayed quiet and if they never did anything. Um, that would be then, okay, that's a real problem we've got, that fabrications happen. But if they stood up to this issue and they defended the deen and they defended the sunnah, which they did, then I don't understand how this question remains a problem. So in the book, I've got this whole section where I kind of show the muhaddithun constantly saying that we we are aware of fabrications and we, we are up to that challenge. So uh, ad Qutni, rahimahullah, he actually says... Um, and this has been quoted, I think, by uh, I think Ibn Hibban or someone. But again, I'm just thinking of the death dates. Ibn Hibban is before Dar Qutni, so that can't make sense. Uh, but someone quotes it, and I've put the reference in the book where you can read it. He says that he says, "Ya ahl Baghdad, la tawunnu an ahad an yaqdir an yaqdib ala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Don't let any one of you think that you can lie upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa ana 
Hadir, like he says, and I'm alive. Wa hai. That don't you dare think I'm going to let you get away with it. I, I know what you're doing. I've learned the hadith properly. So it all relates back to that whole system of their reliance on memory. Memory always supersedes. And that's, again, another reason why Nabi Sallallahu wanted the Sahaba to rely on memory. Because, you know, with books, I can add in stuff into a book. And in that early period, especially, you can steal someone's book and kind of mess about with it. And, you know, because he doesn't know what he's, what's inside the book. So, and that's why some of the muhaddithun used to have this condition that he must memorize everything that's in his book. Because possibly at night, someone added something into the book. So memory preserves that. They were like supercomputers. And essentially, the most important thing that we need to remember is that the fabrications were something that the muhaddithun were well aware of and they would actually go and acquire the fabricated ahadith and then they would acquire the authentic ones and then when they would be asked why are you acquiring the fabricated version Ibn Ma'in would be asked he says that so that when I come across the authentic ones and I, then this one pops in فَلَيْتُهُ فَلِيًا to that effect he says I'll, I'll just grab it and chuck it out like how you you know whip aside a, a piece of hair that's stuck inside your uh, food or something like that so but again it's about now defending this methodology going right into the nitty-gritty with certain orientalists who like you know draw all of these long long diagrams and try to make us more confused about what's happening and then you know taking it from there and defending the sunnah literally reliving their trip because they defended this hadith we are defending their methodology and we technically inshallah all going to be part of amongst those who are defending the Prophet. And I, I wrote this once that it's very similar to in the Battle of Uhud where we had certain Sahaba literally guarding the Prophet. We are literally, if we do that this oh, in this day and age, we are doing that literally. And subhanAllah, it must have been pretty hard to uh, even fabricate uh, amongst the ulama because, like you mentioned, the madads, right? So they were uh, certain pivotal people. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like if somebody does come up with a fabrication, not he cannot just fabricate the text. He has to fabricate the chain of narrations and uh, the chain of narration. It's like a decentralized network like uh, Bitcoin in a way. So you're going to have 100%. like all yeah. of these uh, people checking you and attacking you. Like, what are you talking 100%. about? So exactly what you said that the they have like other students also. And, you know, they're going to be checking you, too. 100% and what you said there is actually one of the qara, you know, indicating factors that the muhaddithun would use to kind of prove that you're lying If I right now narrate a story from let's just say someone I've met Like let's just say Mufti Shabir Sahib is one of my teachers I narrate a story and it's such a crazy story yeah. And I'm the only one narrating this story whereas he has tons of students and no one else is narrating this That's automatically a like question mark and the muhaddithun picked up on that So Shacht in his book he says even the Mutabaat, even the supporting yeah. narrations of fabrications. So let's just say you narrate something from Mufti Shabir. I think mm, that sounds like a good story. Let me also say I heard it. Right? So how would the Muhaddithun pick this up? Yeah. Because technically you're saying the truth, but I'm lying. But even that they picked up and they call that you could say like Sariqatul Asanid, stealing mm. of other people's Asanid. And they would pick it up literally by comparing and contrasting and even learning about the lives. So they would pick up, okay. okay uh, you know, uh, uh, etc. is in America. How did he go yeah, from America absolutely. all the way to the UK? So they would learn the life of the. So this is what one of the Orientalists says: is he says that in protecting the Prophet, they memorized the lives of everyone who's trying to connect themselves with the Prophet. So they learned wow. literally the lives of myself, yourself, because we are trying to attribute something to Mufti Shabir Sahib. Literally, the Muhaddis would learn everything about us to make sure that our attributions are correct. And so they would pick up, how, how is that possible? He he lived in that time, he lived in there, and how could he have met him there? That's not possible. And and it, would have, like, it, would have, it would have been like a very uh, strong, or like uh, a fraternity where everybody kind of knows of the other. And uh, like with us, maybe when we uh, look at the books of Rijal, it's like you have to you have to have a lot of mu'ayasha with 100%. the books, right? But for, for them, it was like, like you mentioned, they're, they're in that time, they know the people. And does that mean that they would always all agree upon one narrator? No. At, at times, that is what led to like a difference of opinion over a certain narrator. Um, at times, the, the, you know, for example, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, is a good example. You know, it shows the kind of precaution that the muhaddithun had. That I, I don't see their criticisms on Abu Hanifa as like, a, mm, this. What, how shall I make sense of like what the muhaddithun... That for me kind of re-engages and re-supports the whole idea of how critical the muhaddithun were. They just saw even someone like Abu Hanifa, and even though he was completely reliable in that sense, but there's a statement of Ibn al-Qattan, who's a great muhaddith. He says, 
and this was mentioned to us by our teacher again just to attribute it to the person who, who mentioned i never read it myself it's been said like i saw it in the book but it's his um he drew my reference to this which is that um don't fear لا تخاف على المحدث. don't fear upon a muhadith to to uh that he'll allow a fabricated hadith to come into the hadith corpus but fear upon him that an authentic hadith will he'll or, or like a reliable hadith will kind of he'll chuck it out so what he's trying to say is that they're ultra precautious and that's why we have some attacks against even you could say the ahlul ra'i the hanafi fuqaha was sometimes disparate because they just want to make sure they like really you know how you have like a little baby and you just you know you're you're you're, you're, you're cradling that child like you don't want anything to happen even if it's not even going to harm the baby like no no don't 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 you know that's how i kind of envision uh, and that's what i see in the muhaddithun's writings you just see that kind of fikr and that uh, concern that they will attack sometimes their own children, their own, because they feel like, look, I'm not going to let you narrate a hadith. I'm sorry. I just don't think you're, I know you're my son, but you're not reliable. Uh, you're you're going to mess it up. Yeah. So I know we have like five minutes left. And uh, so I'll just, uh, we'll probably, because uh, some of these questions, we address them in the in the presentation yeah. we're doing on the five stages. And I really want to encourage uh, everybody to, inshallah, when the book does launch, do get the book and uh, enjoy, inshallah, and inshallah. interact with it. And, but um, so one, just two qu common questions, inshallah, before we close off. Number, number one was that can weak narrations ever be used? This is actually a common, more common question. Yeah, now. I mean, it's uh, this is another one where I don't know how I'm going to do it in five minutes. Um, this is such a, because I don't want to sound like Jordan Peterson where I'm like, what do you mean by weak? <laughs> and what do you mean by narrations? <laughs> and what do you mean by, you know, I don't want to go down that line, but it is a bit <laughs> like that. Unfortunately, it is a bit like that. Like, what do you mean by weak? Uh, what do you mean by narration? You know, it is a bit like that because it's like, well, if you look at it from the muhaddithun's perspective, like I just said, they were very precautious. They were super precautious. So to, for us to say, and again, just to go back to that whole idea of what is weak, can anything weak be attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu in that sense? Nothing. Uh, we have to be precautious and we have to be careful. Um, so... When we say weak, we're going to have to say, what do you mean by weak? Okay, so if you're saying weak, sanadin, i.e. the chain of narration has a weak narrator in there, and that's why it's weak. Yeah. Okay, now we can have a discussion, right? So it's a weak chain of narration. So if that's the scenario, I would definitely say that for the muhaddithun, it's it's definitely very restricted. They do allow it. They do allow it when it comes to, like, for example, fadailul amal, etc. Uh, but this is the whole issue. Like, will they label a certain action as mustahab or not if it's found in a hadith? So obviously on this topic, I I, I did because I you know was anticipating a question on this. So I did actually bring, you know, the two famous books that everyone's probably heard of. Um, this is a book by Sheikh Muhammad Awama, Hukm al Amal bil Hadith al Da'if. Um, the issue that obviously with this book is he does he does try his best to kind of prove that the muhaddithun were using, um, or they were relying upon, you could say, um, weaker hadith to establish certain rulings. Um, but it wasn't basically wajib. They weren't labeling the thing as a wajib or fard, etc. But it was they were establishing istihbab. Okay. Then you had a rejoinder written to and that book. Istihbab means just preferability, right? Preferability. Whereas this book, this is a response written to it, Al Jawab Al Latif by Sheikh uh, Zakaria Al Yusufi. And I, Alhamdulillah, what I did was I read Sheikh Awama's book first, completely empty-minded. I thought I want to read this. I want to make my notes. I want to carefully deconstruct exactly what he's saying. So I made some notes on it. And I can share these notes. I don't know if you guys have a platform or something like that. I did a kind of muqarana between the two books, a comparison between the two books, uh, the merits and demerits of both. Um, hey, we and, have a website now with the article section, inshallah. Sure, sure, inshallah. inshallah. Um, I don't mind sharing it. I don't, because because this became a very heated debate, I don't want to cause any controversy. But basically, I then read Sheikh Yusufi's response. He is saying you can't even establish any istihbab. You mm. can't even label the action as fabricated, uh, as uh, encouraged using um so using like a weak hadith. Hadith. Fabricated hadith. Yes. yes he's saying if the if the chain of narration has a weak narrator in there or if there's some weakness in the chain of narration or the hadith is weak basically because of the chain of narration or whatever yeah. you can't use that to establish that the action is preferable what he says is you can use it for isti'nas what that means is the action is already established using authentic hadith but you can only now if there's some extra reward mentioned in a weak hadith mm. you can have hope of that extra reward because of the fact that it's in a weak hadith Sheikh Omar is saying something slightly different He's saying you can actually establish uh, Istihbab That something is slightly preferable Using a hadith which technically 
it's weak. In fact, he even goes as far as saying very weak, which definitely is questionable. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would say, just to like uh, question some of these uh, things, is that we need proper research on this. I think a good five, six volume book is needed on this topic. I think a one volume book is not enough. There's another book that's come out, by the way, that does a comparison between these two. The thing I would say about the Sheikh Omar's book, uh, uh, may Allah you know, increase him in his uh, uh, life and you know, obviously incredible scholar, is that I initially, when I read it, I got the impression that he's just trying to defend the fuqaha and he's not encouraging uh, the narration, narrating of weak ahadith in bayanat, in lectures, etc. But then near the end of the book, he does kind of say that if you narrate a weak hadith, you don't need to let the audience know that the narration is weak. That kind of gives me the impression that he's talking about lectures, yeah. uh, which I don't know. I'm not. I, I just think we've got too many lectures where in it's just weak hadith being quoted one after the other. I I think it's gone too far. I think it needs to be restricted more than it needs to be maintained. Um, we need and to even uh, one question, even like weak is not a monolith, right? Like you'll have degrees of weak. Exactly. So that's what I was going to touch on next, which is that the other slight critique I would have is that why try to make it look as though that the muhaddithun were doing this? Um, if we know that the fuqaha looked at the text of the hadith a lot more, we can say that a certain practice, the fuqaha had, Ill, you know, they allowed it to some degree. But even that, it was more related to fiqh. A lot of the questions we're going to get about weak hadith are going to be to do with some certain salah that someone wants to read or certain practice. Uh, I think, wallahu <laughs> alam, um, it's uh, precaution is needed. I, I, you know, I think that, wallahu alam, labeling the action as anything above mustahab is definitely not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, if it's to do with fadailul amal, I think one thing that definitely works in the favor of Sheikh Awama is mm -hmm. if you look at certain early muhaddithun, they did write loads of books on this, a zuhud, um, on you know, asceticism or you could say piety, etc. Targhib al and they have loads of a hadith in there that are problematic. Obviously, the response to that given by Sheikh Zakaria is that those were riwayah. They were, yeah. were just narrations. They were simply narrations. They are not encouraging you to practice upon them, which obviously is still a bit like, well, the riwayah creates... Yeah, I think it also has to do kind of with like bi'a and like environments. Some places, exactly. these things just become, you know, all, anything goes. 100%. And automatic, you need to rein it in. And then in 100%. some areas... It's all it's overly restrictive and anything you say like the awam or like just attack hundred percent. I think Mulla, you're talking like a, how a faqih should be talking there. And that is I think on this issue as well, it should be left to the fuqaha to kind of decide how what type of approach we should take towards the weak hadith looking at their locality. In certain localities it's definitely gone too far. I I definitely think if a person came to us and asked us, is this hadith authentic or not? And can I use it in my lecture? I'm not gonna use the muhaddith, I'm not gonna use the fuqaha approach. Mm. Because the fuqaha didn't, they were engaged in fiqh, they were engaged in legal rulings. This is now a question more to do with fadailul amal. I will use Imam Shafi's approach of looking at the sanad, looking at the narrators of hadith. Uh, the fuqaha approach, you need to have ijtihad abilities, first of all, and you need to have a really. And technically, if I went to Imam Abu Hanifa and I asked him, Can I do this certain salah? And, and you know, if I do it, I get this much reward. Imam Abu Hanifa would be like, I'm not got time for that. I'm dealing with mudarab and uh, wakala, and I'm dealing with like how to create governance on this issue and that issue. Right. So on this issue, I do think we should look at the muhaddithun, and I do think the issue in certain communities has gone way too lax. Yeah. Um, I think it needs to be reined in, but that's just personal approach. And Allah I Adam, I, uh, look, some people are going to get really uh, touchy on this subject. So you know, I, I had a, I opinion. actually had a question on this point, and I'm not sure we can actually have a separate discussion on this, but. Like for example, you'll have books, um, uh, uh, like earlier books, um, like okay, for example, Hidayah, or not not ver very early books, but like Hidayah or Sharh yeah. Anil Athar, and then you'll have Takhrij on those books done, yes. right? Yes. And then you you look uh, at the bottom, like okay, you have the um, a certain hadith that are that are brought in the nest to support the conclusion, but then the Takhrij will say that okay, this is the yeah, Majid, or, yeah. majid yeah. or exactly all those things. So for so for a a student of knowledge who's studying this, who doesn't have in-depth knowledge, how do you understand this? Because yes. it's like, okay, this Mukharij has just undermined everything, but it's 100%. obviously not the case. 100%. So that's why I would say, so as someone who teaches Hidayah, I have that I have that issue all the time, obviously. And that's why I would say the history of fiqh and showing the difference in methodology of Abu Hanifa is very important because as strange as this sounds, for Sahih Hidayah, I don't think that Hadith or his, like, he, if you told him the Hadith, if you went back to him and you said, guess what? Do you know this hadith you quoted here? It's not authentic. He'd say, it doesn't change my book at all. Hmm. Because he's not going, it's more down to like, he's following juristic reasoning. 
he's more basing his mas'ala around what I think is like the qawaid kulliya, the general principles of sharia that he's kind of, yeah. because he's thinking, well, okay, fine, on that, it's weak. On this one, we don't even have a hadith. What are you going to say? So he'll look at you and say, well, go on, give me an answer. There's no hadith on this topic. What are you going to say? So he's saying, I'm, I'm not making the hadith my focus, so to speak. There are a hadith that Imam Abu Hanifa, so to speak, you know, or communal practice, or even rather authentic hadith that were authentic according to Abu Hanifa that he used to come up with his rules. But now he's just basically doing takhrij upon those rules. And it's more like this, like these r- legal rulings or legal reasoning that he's now using to kind of formulate law. And if you notice on a few places where Sahih Hida has actually done this, he'll bring the aqli dalil before the naqli dalil, so to speak. And that's what that is 100%. That's all further proof of the fact that for him, it's not about the hadith. Like if you showed to him, uh, you check the takhrij and you find out, okay, no, th- this whole wording is not even found from anyone. In fact, the opposite is found. He wouldn't change his th- thing because he's just putting that more as... I, I still, Wallahu alam, I'm still looking for good research on this topic of how to make sense of the hadith of uh, Sheikh Suhail Hanif has got some decent writing on this, who is a writer in the, in, in the UK. But I, I don't think that hadith or he's like, it wouldn't change his book because he's following the kind of legal rulings and uh, juristic reasoning and the philosophy, if I can use that word, the yeah. philosophy of the mas'ala that Abu Hanifa has conceptualized. So, for example, if you take the mas'ala of Wells, um, you know, he's taking in the concept of haraj that, you know, we, we will allow a certain amount of dung to fall into the, uh, a certain amount of droppings to kind of fall in because there are animals that will be around. The, but if it gets to a certain level, then, you know, if a person who looks at it thinks it's too much, we need to stop it straight away. So in that way, it's this kind of balance where Sahibul Hidayah is not basing, he's not a zahiri, like he's not the hadith that this one from. He's, he's, a, he's a faqih. He's looking at the whole kind of like, I'm formulating like the entirety of law here and it needs to be a consistent law. And that's the most important for Sahibul Hidayah. He'll always try to show you consistency. And it's like this, I'll, I'll give you one last example so that you, this makes sense. Uh, when it comes to the mas'ala of um, Isha Salah, when should we do it? So he says that after Nisful Layl, I think he says Makru, but you should delay it as much as possible up until that point. So what he's trying to do there, and he gives the two reasonings, and the two legal reasonings I'm saying is here, there's no hadith, there is a hadith, but his main objective with this, by the way, is he's saying Qat'u Sawr, he wants to stop that nighttime talking uh, after Isha, so he's saying delay as much as possible so they can do all their talking before Isha and then after Isha they're so tired they want to go to sleep and at the second one, the other thing he wants to do is takthirul jama'ah mm. we don't want to delay so much that the jama'ah is very small and both of these by the way are supported by multiple hadith okay. uh, not talking at night and takthir of jama'ah is like a philosophy of sharia that he wants to maintain takthirul jama'ah, we want to increase the jama'ah so there's more unity, there's more people coming to the masjid so that's why he's now stipulating the timing of Isha to be around this time. Hmm. Uh, so those are the kind of ideas. He's working more with ideas than he is with a hadith. And those ideas are built upon multiple Quranic ayat and a hadith. So that's yeah. how I would approach it. So uh-huh. you're, if I understood correctly, you're saying that he's not necessarily claiming uh, to bring like the whole, like all Absolutely. the different proofs of Imam Bukhani. He's doing a post hoc analysis. Think- I think anyone who brings post, that, I like that. I think you said something about post analysis, so to speak. Okay. I, I like, yeah. I, I think anyone who reads Sahibul Hidayah as Al Hidayah thinking this is the proofs of the Hanafi Madhab, as in the Hadithi proofs, I think the, I don't think it's the right way to look at it. Nasbur Raya, the Takhrij on Hidayah, maybe that's a good way to do to look at it there. But for Hidayah, it's more about trying to get into the mind of Abu Hanifa, trying to think like how Abu Hanifa thinks. It's more about legal reasoning and how how to engage with yeah. it. Uh, I think this is actually a very, uh, this would be a good topic for like an elaborate presentation. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, also, I have got content on it, inshallah, if we need to. Inshallah. So I'll just, we'll have one last question, inshallah. There's just so much we're gleaning from you right now. I actually didn't expect this to be this long, but wallahi, <laughs> this has been one I've, I've, been, I've enjoyed a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm just looking at the time. Don't worry. I, there is another masjid that I can pray it, uh, salah in as well. So I will I will just go to the other masjid. Okay, so we won't to hold too long. Inshallah. We have this one last question, inshallah. Yeah, sure. Once that's off, then inshallah. We'll... Yeah, absolutely. No problem. No problem. So, these days, some people consider science and reason when evaluating the strength of narrations. So they'll yeah. say, for example, it doesn't gel with, you know, uh, our reasoning or science kind of goes against this. And they 
a factor that into whether they would uh, hold that narration or how they appraise the narration itself. Yeah. So to what degree is this problematic, or is it problematic? Is it problematic? That's that's probably the question that I think is quite important. That is it problematic? I think if it comes in with like an ad hoc type of like rejection of hadith simply based upon the fact that it's just automatically contradicting the hadith, I think there lies the problem. Otherwise, I think to also just view every scientific discovery as though like it, you know, we disregard it, hadith comes first. It's not always like that. And we, if you look at even our early scholars, they didn't view it like that. So I, I just, uh, you know, I'm just going to quote something from Al-Khattabi. Obviously, Khattabi says something in his Ma'alim, in his A'lam al-Hadith, which is a sharah of, his sharah of Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, وَلَيْسَ بِنَا حَاجَةٌ And he mentions this on page, uh, this is on p- volume 3, page 1126. He says, وَلَيْسَ بِنَا حَاجَةٌ I'm just going to read the English. We have no need to present with the statement of the Prophet Wasallam, the truthful, the accepted, the one to whom the revelation brought secrets of the unseen, as support the statements of doctors who have only acquired what they have acquired from their knowledge through experimentation and investigation. And in the words of one of their peers, Hippocrates, at the start of his book uh, titled Aphorisms, experimentum periculosum experiments are deceitful now obviously you read that and you think fantastic i've got all the evidence i need to kind of reject all scientific discoveries and to just go with whatever the hadith are saying i think the balance is important what we went through with like obviously sheikh um you know the rashid rida and that whole um modernist movement i think we after we went through that we've become really really like scared to to kind of even we don't want to even entertain some of those things that they kind of said because of how sort of off they went on some of these things um but at the same time i want to i want to say that it, their approach was very different we knew the mindset they were already coming up with the the modernist movement in that time that in, in egypt etc they were simply doing things in many ways to kind of just appease uh, the scientific discoveries the secularism that was taking place we don't we don't just because of what they did we don't need to be kind of like so restricted at the same time we can't compromise on the ahadith so i want to kind of refer to uh, and i'm sure you probably would have expected this is that this book obviously muntasir's uh, mufti muntasir's uh, the height of prophet adam at the crossroads of science and scripture so what he does in this book is he essentially takes the hadith of uh, Adam, uh, uh, um, the, hadith, the very famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari, where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the height of Adam Alaihi Salam was 60 cubits, 60 dhira, and then the human beings after Adam Alaihi Salam continue to decrease in size. So now he goes to the archaeological evidence, etc. Now, people will have conflicted views about this book as well. By the way, I, 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 someone gave me the impression on this book that he kind of is of the opinion that there's idraj in the hadith, etc. I read the book. I didn't get that impression. I got the impression that he's kind of just giving you all the different opinions and all can the you, different approaches. Can you explain what idraj is? Uh, idraj is like basically the Sahabi has added in something to the hadith accidentally. Like he, This is something he learned from someone else and accidentally he just put it into the hadith. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's pushing for that. He gives that as one opinion that, and I think that opinion is held by Sheikh Yunus Jompuri on this hadith. Um but he, he doesn't force any opinions. He gives you three ways of how you can deal with a hadith that supposedly contradicts. And uh, I just want to look at one more book, seeing as mashallah, I know a lot of uh, students will be, or not a lot of students, maybe even like non-students, but still I think they could still benefit from this, which is another book, which is quite good. Tawfiq al-Rahman lit-tawfiq bayna ma qalahu ulama'u al-hay'ah wa bayna ma jaa'a fil ahadith al-sahih wa ayat al-Qur'an. This is by Sheikh Muhammad Bakhit al-Muti'i. And this is not a modernist. This is, you could say, like someone who Sheikh Zahid al Kothri highly praised. If you just read mm-hmm. his maqalat, he's got a full maqala on him. And even in his book, he's trying, if you read the introduction, he's trying very hard to kind of say, well, we've got three approaches, which is what Muntasir also touches upon. We've got three approaches. Either we try to do jama. And by the way, before I even come to this, we first need to establish that the hadith is authentic and the evidence from the scientific side is also very strong. Mm-hmm. Um, would it be would it be better to use the word conclusive? Conclusive. Uh, so mm-hmm. at times when it's not conclusive, we don't even need to entertain the scientific evidence. Yeah. But when it is very very strong, I'll give you examples of like um, uh, uh, scenarios. I'd say just read the book because we've we've not got that much time. Yeah. But there are times where in you could say 
if you went with the hadith on this, like I don't think anyone does, even from our elders, no one goes with it. Even Kawthari himself, being the most traditional, you got Mu'allim, you got Kashmiri, Mufti Taqi, all of them, they don't go with it. They, 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 they interpret the hadith. So we can either do jama at times. This is only by the way when the hadith is fully authentic and the scientific evidence is also, it's, and it's, there's a complete contradiction. Jama, jama would be to. Just for the audience as a jama is like you kind of reconciling between the two. And, and that's only possible when there's no total contradiction. hundred right? percent. I'll give you a good example. It's just come to my mind. Um, remember that video? I went viral of that uh, uh, Saudi scholar where he's he's saying he's proving why the earth doesn't move, right? So mm. he says, Look, I pick up this glass, right? And if this was he says this if this was the world and if this glass was moving then what would happen is that if this earth was moving, what would happen is that this glass would take me closer to China or something like that, he says. Um, and everyone was just like, oh my God, this is so cringy. And then I came across another video of another scholar saying, you know, that was shamsu tajrili mustaqarri laha, therefore 100% the sun orbits the earth. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we look at the concept of jama, it can open our ideas to more interpretations. And this is something Muntasir also kind of touches upon. Now we kind of know Ashamsu Tajrili Mustaqarri Laha doesn't say anything about the sun going around the earth. And we now know that the sun does move, you could say, around other galaxies, or it, the galaxy itself, you could say, moves. Mm. And therefore, the sun does move. The sun is not stationary. So, because we were so like, no, 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 we, we don't want to touch science, we kind of said, no, the sun rotates around the earth because of Ashamsu Tajrili Mustaqarri Laha. Whereas when you look at the scientific a discovery so far again it's not concrete it's not 100 percent, but it does open up the idea that okay right that's another way of understanding this ayah that it's actually just saying this um so we could do we could kind of do a jama we could do a kind of reconciliation at times we could just give preference give preference to the hadith Wallahu alam. and especially 100 percent. look if it's to do with the unseen go with the hadith when, otherwise we start rejecting miracles and we start rejecting uh angels and we start rejecting and this is the problem like you know if you take it too far you start rejecting the unseen so we don't want to go that far and the last option is tawakuf, and that is a very good approach and on this issue on the height of prophet adam from amongst those who held that opinion was ibn hajar and he actually said i don't know how to make sense of it ibn hajar actually says in fatul bari on this issue of adam uh, you know he's saying there's no evidence to show from archaeological perspective that you know, we've noticed the skeletons getting smaller. This is Ibn Hajar speaking, not a modernist. So, is the balance is when you will know straight away when someone withhold judgment, basically, hundred percent. And we will know straight away when someone is abusing the system. When we know this guy is already coming up with some preconceived notions of modernism, and he's already just uh, his agenda just generally just seems. To, and this is what we had with the modernist movement, where it was like. It was a barrage of trying constantly to just prove that this hadith is not authentic and this hadith is not authentic um, because it contradicts this, this. They were trying too hard. Whereas in this book here, for example, we do have, for example, Kashmiri. When it comes to this hadith of the height of Prophet Adam, he says the 60 cubits was in Jannah. Now, technically, you could say, oh, well, Kashmiri, what are you doing? Why are you trying to run away from the, just because there's no archaeological evidence? But you know he's trying to be sincere to the tradition and at the same time he's trying to as much as possible make it make sense Rama Kashmiri would even have been aware of the archaeological uh, I don't think so, yeah. so, he think was, so. I, that means he was purely critiquing it from within the tradition not exactly. really from within the tradition not, not, even not based on any pressure or anything like that 100% and yeah. it's not just him uh, Mufti Taqi Uthmani also holds that opinion um, that so but it's that at the same time it's the balance like I say that and then at the same time you will notice someone else will come in and be he'll try to use that same approach yeah. for every hadith out there so that is where the line that Mufti Muntasir kind of draws and he indicates towards it at the start of the book which I liked a lot is ta'asuf the, oh. the moment that the wheel is and the reconciliation is looking ta'asuf ta'asuf means you're going it's like it's, it's far-fetched you're trying to make a ta'wil that is, you're trying to make an interpretation which you're going too far. Wow. It doesn't make any sense. A good example of this is trying to make the story of the Prophet Adam salam, and Iblis a metaphorical story yeah. that it represents evil and evil was. The, that's the asuf. What are you doing? Just because there's not, not to mention that it's to do with the unseen. So you don't even need to do all. So there's there are thin lines, there are shades. You will notice some who will be fully like, nope, we go with the hadith, we reject everything that comes from science. And then you will notice someone on the other side 
who will just be like science, 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 and every hadith I even think contradicts the science I'm going to go. And then you have those in the middle. And I think, Allah Alam, the most you try to stay in that middle lane, I think it's better, and you will still have some differences even in that. Middle. And I think uh, kind of like, to summarize, it's almost like not being reactionary, neither to those who are trying to take it, hundred uh, percent, run with it in the science direction. And also not to be reactionary to those people and just kind of hide in the, you know, on the other extreme. But I, I, I think that word is in the middle. Perfect. So. But to be a bit more, to be a bit more nuanced here, uh, I think um, like what we mentioned about conclusive scientific evidence, right? Like you would have a scientific fact, this would be mm -hmm. conclusive. But if something is a theory or a law, something which is a model, which which is prone to change, right? Like for example, somebody, um, and I know like the, the um, what's it called? A geocentric versus heliocentric model that whole uh narrative uh that was more like a christian problem i think we have in our tradition uh it was yeah, it's not yeah. we didn't necessarily have that yeah. issue but yeah. assuming like pretend we did for a second um you could still have uh, uh like uh, for example if a muslim now okay the heliocentric model um uh you know you could say okay uh, the first thing is you have to be good in usul right like the uh, is the dilala qat'i uh, is there any dilala that um uh first of all that the the, the earth uh, or or the sun is uh, like what, what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the sun is moving uh okay um sorry i just lost my train of thought but uh for for um like is it possible basically that the earth is moving around the sun but yeah, it looks like the sun is not moving. But is it possible? Is it Jai's Aklan that the sun could also be moving at the same 100%. time? So it is possible, right? So if you're like kind of good with usul and and mantiq, then you could just like you know yeah. uh, preemptively kind of avoid so these issues. That that's exactly what some of our uh, scholars did when it came to some of these uh, hadith. They literally just said, well, basically, look, it's not dilala qatiya, and that's yeah. what you know. It's very important that people understand that whilst even the Quran is. Thubut is 100% established. Not a single word do we have doubt over. The meanings, there, there is debate over certain meanings. Certain 100% established. Certain meanings, there can be some difference of opinion over scholars exactly what is the Quran trying to say here. And then you go to the hadith and there's difference of opinion over what the hadith are trying to say. That can happen and that is, you can never ex ex escape that because the Prophet has passed away. And he's not going to be here at every moment in our lives helping us and telling us. And that's the kind of marches of the Quran and Sunnah that and we extract from the Quran and Sunnah. And so what you so mentioned, like uh, the, the case study, and uh, you know, I'm really happy you brought the case study because that's one thing I liked and that you always bring examples. So that's very helpful. So, for example, with Adam, um, the fact that there is no archaeological evidence for giants um, you know, this could. Uh, this is something which is uh, definitely not qatri or hundred percent. Okay. So uh, that can I just inter so yeah. I was I was in the gathering of I don't want to say the scholar's name, but um, I was in the gathering of a scholar in in in, um, in uh, Saudi Arabia, and someone presented this book, and I I I thought they made it look like I um, I, I don't think it created an accurate picture of the book. It made it look like this book is claiming that the yeah. hadith is there's some either there's some addition made in the hadith and. Um, I'd never got that impression, but I don't know. Wallahu alam, I could be wrong. And when even, they said that to him, he got so like, and he's a, such a talented scholar, uh, someone who I think is fairly, you know, very, very well versed in, you could say, hadith. He was like, nope, they haven't found it, the evidence yet. They will find it. Lack you know, of evidence is not evidence. Going lot. down that line, he was saying that that's not enough. The fact that they've not found the evidence for it, that could be found later on. So you will still find, you know, like I said, that whole that that how do you say the whole range and spectrum of different ways of looking at and reconcile yeah. the only thing you don't want to be is on those two extreme ends i think yeah. um and and it would be interesting to explore like you know within theory like if something can something ever get strong enough to where we use that you know uh, uh, like it has high probability enough but when you look at the history of science then yes. you know you'll see that people always think that you get a tendency to think this is extremely strong and then yes. you have like paradigm shifts and it'll collapse the whole yes. thing i mean another good example could be evolution right yeah the, the, the scientists will make it look like it's like 100% uh et etc and you know we can't you can't you cannot even debate on this issue it's up for you cannot question evolution this is all like uh, this is where uh, you've got books now yeah. discussing the philosophy of science and showing how 
things change and yeah. discoveries change and we've we are not where we were maybe a hundred years ago and maybe a hundred years later we'd probably and even not. the word scientific fact like one is its technical definition one it's its collo colloquial usage sometimes the colloquial yeah. usage is like a very strong theory yeah. but uh, there are certain like scientific facts quote unquote that have been debunked and they were actually not scientific facts yeah i think way. someone I saw on Twitter, I've not read the book and I've not even ordered it, but I've saved it. Someone recommended a book. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's called What Is This Thing Called Science? And mm -hmm. they said that that book is actually really good. Again, I'm just quoting yeah. uh, a recommendation. Maybe that book is something you want to check up on Amazon or something. I think that book kind of goes through the philosophy of science and how you shouldn't just trust everything science as though it's like fact and just. So that's that balance that comes in. Yeah. Um, Allahu Adam, it's a, it's a tough one. Jazakallah khairan and Mu'ayyad uh, Sadullah. Yeah, Jazakumullah khairan. I know we've gone over the, this is probably the longest podcast we've Definitely. done. Right? No, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Jazakumullah khairan. But I've got a, I've got a, a maybe like just um, yeah, final one, word. More, one or two more books that I had bought here just to kind of, um, I think I've gone through all of them. There was one more in the Tedween that I'm not going to do any talking. I'm just going to show a few more books. I do like to show students books that yeah. they can. Yeah. It's an Urdu book. I don't know if you've got any like Urdu listeners, but if you do, this is a highly, you might think it's all to do with Imam Ibn Majah and, you know, or Ilmi Hadith, but it's actually got loads of discussions on Tedween and I highly recommend this book. Um, and there's one more just to understand some of the concepts that I said about Abu Hanifa in could Hadith. You, could you give the audience the author of the that book? Yes, this is uh, Malna Abdul Rashid al Nu'mani yeah. of Imam Ibn Majah or Ilm Hadith. This should be available in a num number of bookstores. Maktabatul Bushra have printed it. If you're in the third year, fourth year, fifth year, even the sixth year, I would say you should read this. It's fantastic. And one more to just remember, we spoke about the difference between Sunnah and Hadith and kind of understanding how. Fuqaha looked at things slightly different to the Muhaddith and then this is the book that I would highly recommend. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called Raddul Hadith Min Jihat al Matn uh, by Dr. Mu'taz al Khatib. Um, again, you might not agree with everything in the book, but I, I think he makes some really good points. Certain mm -hmm. points you might not fully agree with it. But Wallahu Adam, uh, those are just a few extra books that I thought would be good. I'm, I'm actually happy that we had you on and we had this long podcast. Just, it kind of opens eyes, at least even to the listeners and to a lot of people, about. Um, the depth that these sciences do go into, and it's not as um, simple. And we've turned a lot of these major deep sciences into a few slogans here and there. It's a good life. And yeah, yes. and uh, everybody's kind of like having their go at it without actually, you know, understanding fully. And Jazakumullah uh, khair. Jazakumullah khair for having me. And we hope to have you in the future and also you know, work with you. Project Ahiya is, inshallah, a platform that you can consider like your own. and. I just want to encourage everyone if, if they can inshallah to you know this book is for alim students as well as even you know anyone who benefits from it even academics I think inshallah will benefit you know inshallah, it should be available I wanted to say inshallah uh, every, I encourage everybody that's listening to uh, do get the book inshallah when it comes out uh, we'll post inshallah hopefully on our platform when the it's called An Introduction to the Science of the Noble Hadith. And also, Mufti Saab, if you could uh, tell or and inform the audience about where they could uh, get in touch with you or maybe like, yeah. follow you or some platform. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I'm, uh, so if you basically go on the website, all the um, you know links will be there for the Twitter. Um, I'm not so active on Instagram. But my wife kind of you know put some uh, information there. I'm not really onto it so much, but we do have an Instagram page. Uh, Facebook and all of that is inshallah there. But on Twitter, my name is just basically Mu'az Chetty, and you will be able to find it inshallah on Twitter. And the website is islamicknowledge.co.uk. Islamic so it's nice and simple name inshallah. Hopefully, you know you can remember it, and Very everyone well. should be able to remember islamicknowledge.co.uk inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. How about you want to add into the end inshallah? Then we'll close. No, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, Mufti Mu'ad, and uh, uh, just a reminder to the viewers: please like, subscribe, and and spread the channel. Um, and uh, you know, share the video so that it can reach the um, maximum amount of people. And inshallah, with that, we'll close. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.